Welcome. Welcome back, guys. What's up? Did you have fun? This weekend was great, huh? No? Yes? All right. Anyway. Man, this podcast that I'm going to release, man, it's uh, it was super weird doing. I'm not going to lie. You know? And for a talker like myself who can ramble and ramble, um, you know, like, I think that doing this podcast has actually really made me more like in tune with just thinking about like I I really can't explain it man like just going back and revisiting all these thoughts and experiences and and the progression and the path that I was on and this and that and the other man it just it kind of like puts a lot of things now in my life in a different perspective and it's kind of making me readdress a lot of my thoughts and wants and needs and and direction and things like that. So if I wasn't a confusing fuck before this podcast, I am definitely one now for sure. So maybe that's the, maybe that's why you like, you guys are listening to me because I just, I'm fucking all over the place. You know, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but you know, this podcast, you know, is, uh, it was just something that, you know, I had a few people reach out to me and ask us to do, uh, me and my brother Jesse had talked about doing it a few times and really just couldn't figure out the best way to, to do it. You know, like it just couldn't figure it out, man. And, uh, you know, I recorded one already and it was fucking two and a half hours long. And I stopped at the exact same spot. I stopped on this podcast. So I shortened it up and I, I, I hit the, I, I listened to it. It was kind of like a ramble fest. So I went back and I redid it in a way where I just kind of had some notes and I hit key points that were really relative to, you know, maybe things that you guys might be interested in or, you know, just things that are not just like going off topic and segueing to shit that doesn't have anything to do with me. You know what I mean? So this was a second attempt at it. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just going to put it out there, you know, fuck it, whatever. Right. Um, but this kind of gives you a taste of me where I came from you know like I tried to be as honest as possible you know I wasn't trying to say that everybody in the world fucked me and you know I was a poor piece of shit and blah blah you know I just you know looking back on all the problems in my life you know with these set of eyes that I have now you know it's easier to kind of say you know what I was probably a dick at this point in time and deserve this you know situation so at any rate um you know, I hope you guys dig it. You know, I hope you find something in it. You know, if you're a painter looking for like a little edge or a little bit of a, you know, boost mentally or whatever, if, if you just, I don't know, I don't know what you're going to get of it. It's so weird doing it. So, um, but I hope you, I hope you dig it. And I hope that, you know, uh, when I release this one, you know, which will be on Tuesday, um, I'm going to do everything I can. If I haven't already recorded the second part of this, I'll, do my best to have it done so that you can get the second half of this on Thursday. So I don't know. We'll see how it goes. Um, but Hey, you know, as always, man, these podcasts, you know, they, they do have a, they do have sponsors and these are those guys, you know, Texas performance MC, my dude, Mark, he's hands down, got my back from day one. And I haven't talked about on this podcast, the point where we met, but I guarantee you, he's going to play a role in, the process of, of me becoming me it has to be because guys like him and Mike and Mark and, you know, my FXR guys that I always mix up, you know, these guys have been a great or a big role change player. I'm fucking I'm lost right now. They've been the guys that's really helped shape my personality into something that I think is a better person. You know what I mean? So and I don't think Mark is a psychiatrist, but and that's kind of how it just sounded like I'm he's a you know, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, go check out Mark at Texas Performance MC, uh, Texas Performance MC on Instagram and online. Uh, also, if you're in Cedar Park, Texas, or in Austin, or anywhere in Texas, and you want to get your bike worked on by one of the best in the game, go see Mark. Uh, fuck yeah, right? Full service, dyno tuning, performance parts, suspension, motors. You know, fucking just every goddamn thing you can do to your bike. He's got the fucking tools to do it, the skills to do it, and the want to do it. So check him out. Let him know that you heard about him on the podcast, you know. 
uh, maybe go talk to him about the podcast because Mark is one of those guys that I talk a lot about, you know, the direction of this podcast and I take his advice a lot. So, you know, if you're out there getting your bike oil changed and you have an opinion about it, fucking tell Mark. He's he's going to tell me and help me shape this the best way possible for you listeners. You know what I mean? So check him out. As always, since day one, my man, Mark. Also, Paint Huff from Metal Flake. Those are my dudes. Um, I'm so excited about, you know, just the future of working with a company like Paint Huffer, you know, whether it's, you know, the flake that we use or the, or seeing his business grow alongside ours and, and, and what we do for each other and things. I'm, I'm just fucking excited. I really am. Um, Paint Huffer's dope, man. They're, they're fucking like really giving back to the artist community, which makes me super fucking happy because I want to see all you badass painters out there getting the, the, the exposure and and real representation that you should you know not some bullshit seamless stuff where you know you don't get you know we've talked about that a million times but real kickbacks real fucking like exposure you know like where you don't have to literally suck dudes dicks just to be fucking cool you know be be in the in crowd you know no ass kissers just a dude a company that is representing painters that are doing rad shit if you're not doing rat shit and you're not on there, then there you go. You're not on there, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, painthuffer.com. Uh, I'm rambling today, right? Painthuffer.com. Check them out. Painthuffer Metal Flake on IG. If you want to see or get some ideas or rip some painters off, I don't know how you roll, but maybe that's what you do. If not, hopefully not. Get you some uh, fucking some influence, you know, some 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 swag, you know, some some ideas. Go to Painthuffer Metal Flake on IG. Uh, and if you want to use what the pros are using, go to painthuffer.com and get you some of that flake, some of that FBS tape, some of that, uh, you know, them pearlescence and all that great, nice, flaky, bedazzled stuff. You know, you don't want to put that shit on your jeans. You want it on your metal. You want it on your paint jobs, not your jeans. You know what I mean? Step it up, man. That affliction shit's dead, homie. Once again, I'm rambling today. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> and I'm not even drinking. That's crazy. I must be happy. I don't know. It's weird. Horsepower Inc., man. Those dudes, they kick ass, man. Horsepowerinc.net. If you're in the market for any some any type of like performance products limited to uh throttle bodies, <laughs> air cleaners, exhaust systems, and things like that, check out horsepowerinc.net. They're also on Instagram. Horsepower Inc. Uh if you're on Facebook, if you're old as fuck like that, uh, and you just, you know, you know, whatever, you're just on Facebook, right? Still. Not on Instagram. I don't know why, but you're on Facebook. Go to Horsepower Inc. Indie on Facebook. You can also check out all the shit there and probably get links to their website, which is where you're going to be able to get a lot of badass products that they sell. As mentioned, big board throttle bodies, air cleaners, and I don't know if they got the exhaust systems yet, but we talked about it, and I think that's on the way, and I think it's going to be dope when they sell those. So, Stay, stay in, stay in tune with these guys. Stay in, stay in touch with them. See what they're doing. You know, they're going to be putting out exhaust systems in my, to my knowledge, from what we talked about, that are actually going to put numbers on the fucking table, which is important because you know a lot of exhaust, the exhaust companies have the swag but not the fucking balls to back it up, right? In some cases, it's the truth. I'm not trying to knock on anybody, but you know. It's just the truth, you know, so some people are actually going out there and I, I know that some of these other guys are doing it too, but I know for a fact by being in their shop and seeing what they're about, I know that they're going to be putting the effort in to make sure that the products they put out put numbers down. I mean, it's not fakehorsepowerinc.com, it's fake, <laughs> sorry, it's horsepowerinc.com, right? So check them out, follow them. If you're in Indy, Check them out, man. Go by the shop. See that fucking dope-ass spot that I'm jealous that I don't have. You know what I mean? That nice-ass dino and fucking eat sandwiches off the floor kind of, you know, place. That place is dope. Check them out. Get you a t-shirt. If you can't afford a throttle body, at least you're helping out people that you appreciate. So check those dudes out. Dino Tuning Performance for your V-Twin Motorcycles in Indianapolis. And if you see a black dino out there that looks like I rode it up there, holla at your boy. Had to throw it in there. Sorry, guys. Also, don't forget about hard drive. Uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit on um, Garley's podcast, and he, you know, brought up there's a lot of more. There's so many badass people, you know, on in in the catalog. So, you know, if you're not 
if you're a business and you're not fucking, you know, pushing that hard drive, uh, you know, V twin products through your through your shop, man, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Step it up. You gotta get hip to the game, man. This is the new social media, it's hard drive V twin products, bruh. You know, hdtwin.com. You can get you, you can get set up there. You can be a dealer, you know, get them out there. You gotta have a sign on the door, which I don't. That's why I don't have hard drive parts out of my shop yet. And um, you know. Be the guy selling all the cool swag for all these, uh, you know, all this Dyna Bros and, and FXR, you know, cult, I guess is the best word for it. You know, just, just, I think that what hard drive is cool. I think that what they're doing is cool. They're, like I said before, they're, they're kind of tapping into our market or our, you know, these, these companies that aren't as big as like, you know, Vance and Hines and shit. So you got companies like Sawicki and, and fucking, you know, Jesse Rook, like, uh, you know, what my man Garley talked about. Um, yeah, dude, just check them out, man. Just try. And they also have a lot of their own products in which that, you know, branded as hard drive that I actually was interested in putting on my diner. So, you know, check those dudes out. Um, hard drive parts on Instagram. They, they post a lot of the pictures of the products they sell. And, uh, you know, Lindahl Wills is also one, you know, my boy, Paul, great friend of mine, love the dude to death. He, that's one of the, if you're not a, a dealer for Lindahl or, or, you know, which you should be, you know, but if not, you know, it, it, hard drive gives you the ability to have that exclusivity of those wheels. So check them out. Fuck with them. And, you know, fuck, man, just 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 do it. Nike. Right. Man, I'm not I'm not trying to make this super long. I just I just want to give everybody their their fair share of credit that helps us keep this thing going. You know, um, we've had a lot of people start to, you know, I guess when I start talking about it, more people you know, oh yeah, I should probably support this guy on Patreon. So yeah, man, if you can, man, go to our website, fastlifegarage.com. And on the front page, you're going to be able to see a link to our Patreon, uh, our YouTube. And, um, I mean, obviously most of you guys follow us on Instagram to my knowledge. Um, if you're just finding us through searching through podcasts and, you know, check us all out, you can find a link to all of our social media, all of our avenues of whatever through our website. And, um, you know, uh, we really, without getting too deep here i'm really excited about this podcast you know like it's so exciting once you start talking not that we haven't been talking to people but the more you talk to people that 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 you enjoy these conversations like me like i'm enjoying listening to to garley to uh giselle to you know jimmy at fucking hard drive i mean i'm tripping jimmy at uh fucking um that was just horsepower Inc. <laughs> damn it sucked. i'm sorry dude uh but you know I, I enjoyed this and i gained so much from talking to these people and i'm hoping that you do as well you know and um you know as a, as a fucking 35 year old man like i have a lot of responsibility so whenever you know you guys are supporting us on patreon or you're you're, you're sharing this on your instagram or your facebook it's showing other people the podcast maybe maybe you can't afford that one dollar a month i get it i get it but if you share it to somebody else and they see value in this, then maybe they are willing to pay that $1 a month. And so even though, you know, you still help me out, you still help this go. You still help make this something that's going to continue to be here for hopefully years to come, you know? So like I said, it's whatever you can do to help all this stuff work out. You know what I mean? And, and whether it's just sharing it, you know also real quick before we get into this podcast where i get to talk for another two hours um if you are on instagram and facebook and you saw that i just posted a you know the camp out thing that we you know that obviously if you listen to this podcast you heard us you know giselle mentioned to it mention it to me and um i'm really excited about doing that and i didn't i wasn't necessarily trying to make it my my fucking camp out like the fast life garage like it's not i just need a name on there you know what i mean i'm hoping that you know, maybe using our, our business name with the, the social media following we have, it will help bring a lot of people together and so that we can have a great ass time. And it's not a profit thing. We're not trying to make money. All I want to do is see people come to this campground, check out what Adam's doing up there and, you know, support what he's doing. So the camping fees is all that you got to pay to party with us all weekend. You know, um, like I said, man, it's not something that I'm trying to make money on. I, you know, I'm doing this podcast. If I can make a little money doing this, awesome. But this is something I want to do, you know. So I'm paying my camping fees. I'm going. I want to do the fucking Talamina Highway ride. I want you guys to come. I hope you Oklahomies and you 
Arkansas, you know, dudes and all, whatever. I just hope all you people come and hang out. You know, you hear me talking about Giddy Up. You hear me talking about the campsites. I want you to, I want you guys to experience that. If you haven't been to Giddy Up, if you haven't done this, and I maybe let's, you know, maybe, I don't know. I think it could be the same. I've always had a great time camping, whether it's two, two of us or 200 of us. You know, it's going to be a fucking good time. And I hope you guys come out, you know, make some new friends, make some new acquaintances or whatever the fuck it's called. And, and just, you know, just live a little bit, man. Fuck it. Fucking fast life, live fast, whatever it is. You're going to hear all about it in this podcast. So before I get any more on this conversation, you know, throwing more words into this, let me just cut my drunk ass off. Yes, I've had a couple beers. So have fun. Uh, don't judge me. Thanks for listening. Hey, guys. You ready to let the dogs out? Fast Life Podcast. Life. Welcome back, guys, to my second attempt at telling my story. Yeah, dude, it's still weird, even this time around. You know, I, I you probably heard it on the last podcast with Giselle, a girl on two wheels. I kind of mentioned that how I've been working on this this concept of of telling my story in a in the most honest light possible. And uh, I think my first attempt was just too much rambling, which I'm doing right now. (laughs) So, you know, I I think things really kicked off for me in 2004. You know, I was uh, 21 years old at that time. Uh, You know, just to give you like a little bit of tidbits of my younger, you know, era, (laughs) I guess is the word. Um, I grew up, you know, like playing sports, you know, I was, I was big into basketball, you know, I've, I was always into comic books and drawing, uh, but, you know, when I got into like my, you know, teens, you know, basketball was kind of life, you know what I mean, just playing sports in that form and street ball and, you know, this is kind of when N one first came out and street ball was like, playing street basketball was kind of like the the big shit and I was I was fairly good for my you know being my size that you know I'm not very tall I'm only like five nine so but I was pretty good and you know that was kind of my childhood and you know uh my my family my dad my mom you know they're kind of a product of the the 80s you know um needless to say you know my mom uh you know she was a great she's just a great woman she still is you know she uh she raised me all the way up until you know probably my uh eighth grade year of school and then uh I went to live with my dad uh my my brother was just born uh 2000 or 1995 so 1996 97 I think is like when I started high school so I went to go live with my dad and you know kind of alleviate some of the uh the uh the struggles that my mom was having as a single woman to you know raise another kid in the house you know so I went to stay with my dad and, uh, you know, it's kind of a good chance as it's probably one of the most like bonding experiences I've ever had, you know, as far as with him, you know, we're, I wouldn't say we're not close, but we're not very close. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, that was a good time in my life, just being able to spend it with him. And ninth grade was probably one of my most favorite years of high school. You know, basketball was, was, you know, I was, we were, we have a, like a ninth grade school where we went to school at. So there was no like, you know, like I wasn't having to deal with like, you know, sophomores and juniors and seniors and shit like that. So, you know, it was just all our own school, you know, it was fun. But, um, you know, school, high school, you know, ended up falling into other things that I was interested in. Basketball kind of started slowly taking a back seat. You know, the older I got, the more I started like realizing how important it was to kind of have a path or a career direction or where you want to go. I, I wasn't really fond of going to college and things like that, but you know, I was really into architecture growing up and I thought that was kind of the path that I wanted to take. And I was super fortunate to get a job, uh, kind of as a draftsman, but not officially while I was in high school. So I was able to kind of see what that career was like. And I was very fortunate to be able to realize that I did not want to sit in an office my life. So it gave me a a good perspective on which way to push myself you know I would have hated to go to school for four years to get out of school to have a degree and and have that college debt and then go work in some office sitting on the behind a computer every day and realize that this is not what I want in life you know and um, 
I guess it would probably still be good to have that career or that that degree. But, you know, I'm just I'm fortunate that I had that opportunity. So, you know, in high school, I was able to see that that's not what I wanted to do. Um, my dad, uh, you know, kind of ended up going to jail uh, just right before my senior year. And, uh, you know, mom was still kind of on the up and up of trying to get her shit together as well and taking care of my younger brother, Jesse. So, you know, high school, man, I had a full time job. You know, I was uh, shipping and receiving at Kohl's department store, finished high school, got a degree. Uh, I'm not degree, <laughs> a fucking diploma. Uh, and I had my own apartment. I had actually two apartments in high school, you know, uh, on my own and made it, man. It was, it was I, don't, I don't even know how the fuck I did it, but I did, you know, and uh, that was kind of that fell into, you know, uh, realized that I, I liked working on things, like working with my hands, like I liked creating stuff. Like I said, I've always been in the comic books and drawing and and uh, into the creative side of things, which I, you know, whether it was like the shoes from playing basketball, we used to like draw shoes and draw on them and all that kind of crazy shit. But, you know, um, my family has always been in the paint and body business. And, you know, my grandfather, my mother's dad has always been a huge, uh, he's kind of a jack of all trades kind of guy. And he you know, taught my dad how to paint and do body work and things like that and all my uncles. And so it's kind of always something that's ran in our family is that gearhead, you know, do it yourself kind of mentality, kind of a, a an atmosphere. So, you know, my dad at the time when I got out of high school, uh, he was out of jail uh, or it was more like a rehab thing or some shit like that. Um, and he had a, a job at a paint and body shop and I just went and worked under him, you know, prepping cars and doing shit like that. So, I did that for like, you know, a year or two out of high school and then realized that I didn't really want to paint, man. I really wanted to do, I wanted to work on cars. And then I, f I fell in love with the import scene at the same time. This is right when Fast and Furious came out. Really influenced by that movie. It was kind of just cool. It kind of exposed me to, you know, like an underground culture that was taking place here in DFW that, that I didn't really realize was there. And I just, I fell for it real quick. And, you know, it kind of motivated me to want to, work on my own shit and build stuff and I want to be a mechanic so fucking bad you know but you know my roots have always been in the paint and body industry so instead of doing paint and body man I just I wanted to turn wrenches so I went to fucking Walmart and got a job doing you know tire lube and batteries you know what I mean and I did that for years off and on like uh years I say I, it was probably up until you know where I really wanted to start the story which is 2004 you know, I, I quit that job in January of 2004. Um, my mom uh, told me about, uh, you know, this this job opportunity that somebody from her job. Uh, let me ha figure out the best way to say it. So basically, uh, I ended up getting a job as a prepper, you know, just sanding only, just sanding parts for other side customs, which at the time in 2004 was called a shot. The shop was called Air Syndicate. And basically, they just did custom paint work. All they did was uh, motorcycles. I mean, they did a couple cars here and there, but it wasn't really, it was definitely wasn't the main source of what we did there at the shop. But he was the main painter for Strokers Dallas, and I think, I think he still is today. Uh, you know, we were just doing all those crazy bikes, man. Or he was doing all those crazy bikes, those, you know, TV chopper show things and, and you know, all the the big marketing budgets on these bikes were like Coors and Miller Lite. They wanted to build a bike for their brand. So they would hire companies like Rick Fairless, which is Strokers Dallas, to do these jobs. And and this guy, Gary, and uh, his airbrush artist at the time, which was uh, Sal, they were doing this work and they just needed somebody to come in and sand parts, you know. And so that's where I came in, man. I was I was 21 years old, you know, 2004, and I took that job. Uh, still really into import cars and stuff, but you know, next thing you know, just being there all day long and seeing all the bikes that we were working on and sanding them, and and I think the real influence for me to want to get on bikes and just realize that this is the career path that I wanted to take was being around Gary, which is you know, like I said, he's the owner of Other Side Customs. You know, being around this guy, he was. Uh, I, I'm not really sure what words if words like eccentric or I, I'm really not sure what those fucking mean to be honest with you I know I'm a dumbass but the dude was just charismatic he 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 was 
cool. He was hip like a motherfucker. The dude had swag and style and, you know, he was tattooed up. He just fit this lifestyle that was and he had a lot of respect from a lot of people. And and to me at 21, that was, I, you know, I was like, fuck, this dude's the real deal, you know, and um, he had badass bikes. He had badass cars. You know, he made he 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 had money. I mean, I'm 21 years old. I'm, you know, I, I never really grew up with money per se, or, you know, the family that had money, you know, but being around him, it was just, man, I was just mesmerized. So I was like, you know, around these bikes all day long, sanding them, seeing them work on it, just being kind of in the middle of the industry, you know, like I got my foot in the door at the very center of it, you know, working with him who was doing all these high-end, top-notch bikes for the biggest shop in Dallas at the time. So being there, working on that, you know what I mean? Like, it was it was just awesome. It was, to this day, you know, it was a great decision to take that $320 a week to do that job, you know? And I don't really know what the going rate is for entry-level pay for people these days, but, you know, but, you know... $320 a week, man. I was I was 21 years old. I had an apartment in Arlington, Texas. Um, I used to make the trip every day, you know, in, in my car. Um, I ended up ended up selling the car. You know, I got to the point where I was ready to get a bike. And I, I remember bringing it up to Gary and saying, man, I think I'm going to get a bike. And he goes, it makes sense. You work in a bike shop. You should be riding a fucking bike. So I was like, you're right, man. So I, I ended up selling my car, which... At the time, I was I was in the Nissans, really big and heavy, and I had a Nissan 240SX and had a you know the Japanese motor, the SR20 in it, turbocharged, all that fun shit. You know, got me in a lot of trouble, but you know that I sold that car. And I, it wasn't the best looking car, but the motherfucker ran. So I ended up selling that for 4,500 bucks. Uh, you know, Craigslist was kind of a thing already. I, th- I think. I mean, I could be wrong, but I want to say it was. And uh, it was either that or Auto Trader or Cycle Trader or some shit. I found a uh, 2000 ZX6R that was uh, for sale for exactly what I had, 4500 bucks. And I've never been really one to be able to Jew people down on prices and, and get good deals. It's just more like I never really liked people doing it to me for my work. So I've always kind of never done that to other people, you know, so... I ended up getting that job or getting that uh, getting that bike, and you know, I remember very vividly the guy brought it to my house or my apartment at the time. It was February fourteenth of two thousand four, and I just remember it was Valentine's Day, and it just snowed the day before, so it was uh, it was you know kind of snow in the grass, still in the shade, but it was dry outside, cold as fuck though. I mean, it's still in the thirties. You know, I bought this bike. The dude gave me some little bullshit helmet he had with it. It had no visor. It was just some crappy, you know, hundred dollar helmet from who knows where. But um, you know, I didn't know shit about bikes, and I didn't really have friends that had bikes. I just had Gary at the shop and the airbrush guy, which he was. He had a bike, but he wasn't super interested in them. You know, it was just kind of like he was just had one because he worked on them. You know, so getting this bike, I was kind of like in my group of friends. It was uh, I was the only one, you know, at the time. And uh, we used to all go bowling and shit like that. And I remember driving, you know, I was in Arlington, Texas. And then I'm from, like, the southwest Dallas area. It's a town called Duncanville is where I grew up. And so we'd all go to the bowling alley on uh, Sundays or something like that. And, the, and Sunday was the 14th, I believe, of this year. So I got the nerve to ride it around. I was riding around the parking lot. You know, I dropped it a time or two. Um, kind of made me respect the bike really quickly. Uh, but I was kind of, I was too scared to get on the highway. I wasn't really good at shifting through the gears or, or keeping my, you know, mind on which gear I was in and whatnot. So it took a minute to get used to that, uh, that process of riding a bike, you know what I mean? And I'm not super tall. So, you know, sport bikes have always kind of been a taller motorcycle. It's, you know, and for some reason, I don't know why it is, but for everybody that starts riding bikes, like being able to touch the ground with your feet is like, you make it, it's like so important and you get such anxiety because you can't touch the ground, even though technically when you're riding it, you're not touching the ground with your feet. But I mean, I couldn't touch it that well. So it was kind of a, you know, scary thing, or at least it just kind of made me think about it a lot while I was riding. But I ended up riding all the way across town. It was like 25 miles and I just took back roads all the way there. 
It's freezing my balls off. You know, no gloves. I just had a little bullshit ass jacket. You know, and uh, the one of the real reasons that that, that really helped like co-sign on the concept of selling the car and getting the bike was at the time, you know, I was with my daughter's mom, which, you know, she was kind of like the chick I went, you know, my later high school years, I was with her. And, uh, you know, I had a daughter, my daughter was, I was 19 when I had her. So she was just about two or going on two, or she was two at this point in January. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was just a different, it was tough, man. It was like, uh, I thought that, you know, our our relationship was kind of rocky, you know what I mean? We're fucking young and, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's smart for anybody at 19, 20, 21 to be trying to be married and shit. Uh, and I definitely didn't need to be at the time. And um, I thought that being the bike, like I, I knew that she thought they were cool and it was kind of a sexy thing to her. So it kind of made me feel like, fuck, man, if I get a bike, maybe she'll dig me more. It'll It'll patch our relationship up the kid didn't work so (laughs) as stupid as it is but you know it was it was just it was it was crappy but you know through that shitty relationship and that I think that what I'm saying right now is probably one of the things that I want to emphasize the most um throughout my life is that everything that has been the most downest or like mentally draining things in my life have always been the best things that's ever happened to me and I'm going to try to explain it the best I can so you can understand it. But, you know, through those insecurities that I had of being in that relationship, it pushed me to buying a bike, which let's, you know, if you're listening to this, you know what I do and who, whatever, right? That's been my life for the last, you know, what is this, 14 years? So, you know, it's like that shitty, insecure, you know, me got this bike to hopefully fix something and it ended up creating something it created my life you know what i mean so yeah like i said i got the bike man and uh it was uh it was cool you know i i was on it i didn't have i sold my car to get it so i didn't have a vehicle at the time and and uh you know we we as in me and my chick at the time had a car but i didn't have a personal one my mom had a little chevy berlinetta it was like a it was a, a loner, a hand-me-down car that's been passed down through some of a, some of us through the different, you know, different family channels that's needed a car, and so I was driving that when I had to, and uh, it was kind of it was super humbling or embarrassing, I think is a better word, but you know, I if it was raining or if it was snowing or if I had to get my daughter and take her somewhere, I at least had that car to kind of do that. I definitely didn't have insurance on it because. Me being responsible didn't come for a couple more years. I was still just kind of living by the seat of my pants kind of thing, you know. But, you know, like I said, I got the uh, I got the job. I got the bike. I'm starting to kind of reach out and meet other people in the bike scene. I mean, back then it was pretty crazy. All we had was like message boards and shit. We didn't really have a social media aspect that we do now. And uh, where I lived was right by kind of a, I wouldn't say a famous meetup area but like a street over off of uh one of the highways was where a lot of people would meet up on thursdays and then go ride all over town so needless to say i ended up kind of stopping through one day and seeing all these dudes and back in the day i don't know how it is now but back in the day man if you had a bike you pull into a parking lot and there was other bikes there next thing you know you got friends and i've met people from that time that i'm still friends with today you know what i mean that it was just a different time of motorcycles, I think. And I'm not saying it doesn't exist that today. I mean, I'm sure it does, but I'm thankful that it happened then. I'm thankful that it was something that I could like experience. You know what I mean? Um, I had this bike, you know, like I said, February 14th, I got it. And, you know, exactly a month later it got stolen. And remember I told you about insurance? Yeah. I ain't have none of that shit. And so, I was, that was a low, man. And honestly, I just kind of gave you the spill of all the lowest points of my life. I don't really know if I really can associate any kind of capital, capitalization off of this low point. I think this was just a, this was a karma thing of something I probably did that was fucked up. But the bike got stolen. Um, It was just, it it just sucked. You know, it really did. But I was able to, uh, to, whoops. I was able to uh, grow 
or just, you know, I ended up finding another wrecked bike and, uh, you know, I ended up getting the wrecked, bi- wrecked bike, finding, you know, scavenging parts on Craigslist. I ended up having it at my friend's, uh, my a close friend of mine, Chris, who, you know, is a guy that I've been friends with since fifth grade. And uh, he still lived at home. He was kind of, you know, just getting out of, out of his little college degree thing that he went through. But he was still staying at the house, and his house was kind of like the party house. So they had a little 10 by 10 shed out in the back, and um, we ended up building the bike out there and getting the parts together. So, you know, about two months after the my bike got stolen, and this one came about. And so we're, you know, we're like, we're about May. And then me and my chick, you know, my, my daughter's mom, we were just, we were done, you know. And uh, I ended up moving out of the house and all I took was my clothes and a TV that we had just got for Christmas or some shit like that. I don't remember, but this isn't like a TV, like a flat screen. That shit wasn't around yet. This is one of those big ass tube ones, but it was like a 40 something inch. So it was a pretty big TV and barely fit in that little Berlin I had, but I, I took that with me. And then Gary ended up, you know, other side customs, dude, I ended up selling it to him for like 75 bucks. And then I went to the the local paint store and I bought my first paint gun which was like a you know like a little paint store special kind of gun you know what I mean nothing special it was just some bullshit gun but it was my first paint gun man and uh you know I was real fortunate uh Chris the one I just mentioned his his family you know I grew up with them so you know when I left my my chick you know we uh I, they let me come stay at their house, man. They had a three bedroom house. They had he has a younger sister that she, you know, was kind of wild. So she had guys and friends over all the time. And my buddy Chris has always been a little bit more tame. But you know, I just slept in his room on the floor, man. Like I literally slept in his floor for about four or five months. You know, every day. You know, he'd come home. I'd be knocked out on the floor. I'd be coming home at two in the morning and make my pallet on the floor and sleep and. It was cool, man. Like it, it was just, it was a good experience, you know. But even better than that, you know, I, I, you know, I lost that relationship. It was done, and you know, I was just sitting there, kind of thinking of ways and like, you know, kind of developing the confidence to go ahead and start pursuing this this paint stuff. Um, I was kind of like snagging up extra rolls of tape from the shop, like little fine line tapes and stuff like that, to time, you know, just so that you know, at first it was like. We'd be at the house and, you know, I'd, I'd, we'd all be sitting around the kitchen table, you know, my friend's house that I'm mentioning. And uh, the table was like a wood table, but it was like smooth and like, you know, had a really slick surface. So I'd take that little three in blue tape and we'd just be hanging out there and I'd just be laying out flames on it while we're all chilling around the kitchen table. You know, it was just kind of like something I added into just fucking around, you know, it was just it was cool. It was fun. And, you know. I mean, a month or two of that shit, man. And then I started laying out flames on the refrigerator, just playing around, just lay them out and pull it off and lay them out. And it got to a point where I was like, you know, I developed a confidence in it where I was like, man, I'm, I think I could do this shit on a bike. So remember what I said earlier where we didn't really have social media yet. We were still on message boards and shit like that. So I put a post up on a message board that was kind of related to the DFW, uh, you know, mo- motorcycle community. Uh, sport bikes wise and just said hey you know uh trying to get my skill set up name out there uh i'll paint a bike for 500 bucks and that's including material so my my thoughts was is you know if someone gives me a couple jobs i can do it and maybe i'll feel confident in it and i got like three of them and i knocked them out um while i was doing that i started focusing more on w- working on those bikes than i was on my actual job of working at other side customs so you know, uh, one weekend they were moving from the shop that we were in to the shop that he's currently in. So if you're, if you're listening to this and you know who, you know, Gary is another side customs and you know that the shop they're in now is the one that we were moving into at this time. And, uh, instead of me there helping, you know, like I said, we were a three or four man show at the time. And instead of me being there helping all that, you know, I was at my homeboy's house, you know, in the shed painting the bike on my, my own, you know, and, uh, it, I think that I was in the wrong, you know what I mean? Like when you're a small business like that or a small shop, then, you know, you gotta, it's not like working at Walmart where you're, you know, like, I don't know. I really don't know how to explain that dynamic, but 
those other guys felt like I, I left them hanging. You know what I mean? Because, you know, they all worked. They all were, you know, working on keeping their job or keeping their place to make it to where they can work over the weekend so they can keep going on Monday. And I just took my days off like, fuck you guys. You know, so at the time I was kind of butthurt about it. But, you know, looking back now, I understand, you know, why, you know, or why I should have been there, or why, you know, just all that shit. So, you know. Just was is what it was, you know, but yeah, man. So that 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 kind of kicked off, you know, I was like, well, fuck it, man. I, I don't have rent. Uh, I don't have a cell phone. I don't have a car payment. I don't pay insurance. Fuck that. Um, you know, when I just stayed at the house, man, I was painting like a five hundred dollar paint job on a bike. I, I ended up doing like six or seven of them for the next couple of months. And it helped kind of get my skill set up. Um just painting my little 10 by 10 shed in the back of, of my buddy's house, man. I was wet sanding them out inside. I mean, of course, it was still kind of summertime. So it wasn't like uh, I had to deal with like some major, you know, weather issues or whatever. So, you know, it just worked, you know, it was good. And, you know, like I said, I had to do some crackhead shit at that at that time to get my name out there. You know, I had to had to put myself down on that small level of of time just to, you know, get my skill set going somewhere. You know, and I was fortunate that I was able to learn and get some kind of compensation at the same time. I mean, there's there's plenty of things I've had to do in my life where I didn't get paid at all, but I had to do them just so that I could either A, show the world that I can do it, or B, get the experience to know that I could do it. You know what I mean? So it was a crazy time, man. It really was. But still riding a bike. You know, I had a I had that little F4I, the one I, I, I was mentioning that was wrecked, and I, we put it back together and started riding around having a good time man it was fun you know and it was just it was a good first year of motorcycles 2004 you know what i mean january you know the next year comes around and uh i've kind of developed a little bit of a skill set started to develop a little bit of a name for myself as far as being a painter in the motorcycle scene nowhere near famous nowhere near doing great work or anything like that I, i wouldn't even say famous nowhere near known you know what i mean um, but you know, I, I had a better understanding of motorcycles, had a better understanding of, uh, working and painting on painting them. So I was, I was a little bit more valuable, I, I believe to, uh, Gary at other side. So, you know, I, I still would come around and hang out, you know, we weren't necessarily on bad terms or anything. So I would still come around and he ended up hiring me back. And, uh, you know, I was, I think I was working for 380 bucks this time and, you know, he kind of let me do some some buffing here and there, you know, not not consistently every time, but he let me do it. He let me do a little bit more things in the shop. And he also let me bring in some of my own work, which, you know, I, he, I was giving him money for it, but it wasn't like a lot, you know, because like I, I wasn't getting paid big money to paint bikes at all. Not even close. And, um, you know, I started, you know, that whole other year riding around, I started getting real confident, I, you know started being able to pull wheelies up on the bikes and you know that became life (laughs) just doing wheelies and all that shit and it was fun man and and that that kind of you know we didn't I didn't I still didn't have a huge like friend like friend base that that rode motorcycles so doing the wheelies and fucking around and doing all that stuff was fun and uh you know it kind of I started getting a lot of attention from it or just attention from the people I was around and and my friends that I was mentioning earlier, we used to go bowling. They were like, oh, fuck, Jace, dude, Willie, man, that shit's so cool, blah, blah, blah. And so, I, you know, I started getting kind of in my head like a little bit of a cockiness or a little bit of a ego. And I think a lot of it had to do with being around Gary and just his personality and dynamic. I mean, this dude's accomplished a lot of things in his life, and he kind of, if you're going to say that somebody deserved to be able to have an ego or have that cockiness or confidence in themselves, that he definitely did. But... I wasn't old enough to understand these type of things. So I just looked at, you know, I was so influential or influenced by Gary that, you know, I just, fuck, I'm going to be, I'm going to act like this guy, you know, he's cool as fuck to me. So if I act like that, then maybe I'll be cool to other people. You know what I mean? So at 20, you know, two years old this year, you know what I mean? I'm like, fuck man, like really influenced by him. I ended up getting, you know, going through that year, it was fun. You know, later on that year, MySpace came out and that kind of opened up a lot of uh, connectivities from, you know, just old girlfriends from high school and and just 
you know, hooking up with new chicks and all kinds of stuff. So um, it was just kind of a mess, man. But, you know, it was a crazy year. I ended up getting fired again from Gary's. Uh, don't really know why. It's just probably me, you know, getting in my head, trying to be too fucking cool or whatever. I, I know I know for a fact I used to get a lot of girls to come up there and, and you know, instead of doing my job all day, I was trying to fuck these girls or whatever or, you know, whatever the case may be. So I was just like this dude's paying me to be at work every day, but I'm fucking off. You know, I finally got a cell phone. So I'm like sending girls messages trying to get them to come up and and, you know, be mesmerized by the cool bike shit. You know what I mean? Just stupid, stupid shit. Basically what it is. You know, I talk about Jesse all the time being a dumbass, but he's nowhere near as bad as I was. And I think that's why I'm so hard on him because, you know, I was I was just lost. I didn't have a big brother. I didn't have a lot of people. I was very influenced by a lot of different uh, male people in my life just that, that I kind of gravitated towards because of certain things, you know. Um, it was it was a mess, man. But, you know, I ended up getting fired again, went back kind of doing my own thing. Uh, I ended up going and staying at my grandparents' house and a, a close friend of mine at the time had a little Camaro and we ended up like laying out some flames and painting it up. And even to this day, I think the paint job's still fucking cool, you know, but that was a good thing. You know, learning how to do that. I painted the whole car, laid out the flames, did two sets of flames, flaked one out. It, it was a cool thing. We, we rode that thing to car shows everywhere. Uh, I ended up painting my own sport bike. It just, I just painted it all flaked out orange. You know what I mean? I didn't really know how to do, I wasn't really great with a lot of stuff. And I, you know, I realized then it was always going to be a hard thing to do to figure out how to paint your own bike. So that was kind of like the the beginning stages of stuff. But 2005 was just, you know, it was a it was a lot of growth for me, I guess you'd say. <laughs> 22 years old. You know, I'm not I, I didn't drink. I, I wasn't a partier at that age. I just liked I liked to party, but not like I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. I didn't do nothing. I just was more of a you know, I don't know. I just, I didn't do that shit. You know what I mean? So 2006 rolls around, man. I'm, you know, still doing this stuff, still trying to make money here and there. Uh, I think at two, at one point in time, I went and worked at a car uh, collision center for a while and did that stuff and painted a couple things out of it. Nothing major. Um, didn't really like having to be at work at 7 a.m. You know, it wasn't really my thing, um, especially because I was staying out till fucking two, three, four in the morning riding bikes with people. <laughs> but, 2006, you know, I ended up, you know, I was living in Arlington again with this this girl that I was with or this, you know, I ended up being with her for a long time. We had a son together. Um, staying out in Arlington, uh, I ended up working out of a shop. Uh, it, was a, it was an airbrush guy. His name was Mike Sissel, man. He's probably hands down one of the best airbrush artists I've ever known, even to this day. He's, he's still amazing. He actually does all the airbrush work for Other Side Customs, or I, to my knowledge, he still does it all. And, Dude was amazing, but it was pivotal. It was pivotable, I think is the word, of getting to be working out of his shop at the time because he just kind of opened the door and said, "Hey man, just you know, just use the shop. If you make a little extra money, kick it my way. Just help pay for some light electricity and shit." So it was like, it was like a meet. It was a melting pot of a lot of artists, you know, and everybody was hanging out there. We used to have the shop that used to be build choppers back in the day called Iron Horse, and it had a full like paint shop. Right. So they had artists, pinstripers, graphic artists, buffers, all these people. And then when it shut down, all these artists kind of like dispersed and, you know, tried to do their own thing. And he did his own thing and he started to, uh, you know, a lot of the other younger guys that were there because he was an older guy at the time, too. He's, you know, he is older. So, you know, everybody kind of gravitated towards him because he had a really awesome personality and he was very fun to talk to he wasn't like judgmental he kind of was the old guy experimented with a lot of drugs back in the days just cool dude you know and uh so working around him and the other artists that were around like i was kind of exposed to the art side of things which i didn't when i first picked up the paint stuff and i first bought an airbrush which was back in 2004 you know, I tried to draw or I tried to do a skull. Or I tried to do shit with airbrush and it was just so foreign to me because I didn't have the hand eye coordination to uh, to do stuff like that. Like I needed to, you know, I got to a point where I could do drop shadows under graphics and I could do little shades and fades and stuff with the airbrush. But, you know, draw a fucking skull or a rose or whatever was popular at the time was not an option. It was not feasible for me. 
So being around there, being around Sissel and, and the other airbrush guy that was there and the other guys, it was just kind of cool to be there. And it kind of helped elevate my paint style and skills because I was able to, uh, you know, have people say, hey, no, try it this way or do it like this or look at it like this. And I was pinstriping graphics. I was laying out graphics. I was doing paint jobs. I just wasn't quite on the level of an airbrush artist. I couldn't, you know, I didn't have the control, if you want, if you will. Um, you know, I was with Sissel. I worked out of a shop for about five or six months. We did some cool things out of there. Um, it was fun, you know, and then after a while, you know, just all of us being in the same place, it just kind of, it kind of, you know, if anything, I think I wore out my welcome or, or I was getting annoyed with one of the guys there or something, but I ended up finding my first shop. Uh, it was back out towards, you know, by where my grandparents was living and went out there and started doing my own thing, man, and just painting the bikes that I had. I think my shop was $400 a week or a month, sorry. And so it wasn't a huge investment. It wasn't hard to make, but at the same time, like, I think I was getting $1,200 maybe to paint a full sport bike, you know? So you think about, like, you know, $400 a week or a month, and then plus a cell phone, and then you think, like, gas and this and that i didn't have a car yet still i was still just living on a bike i didn't really have a car from 2004 the end of 2004 until 2008 yeah 2008 four years i was kind of you know riding around on my girlfriend's car friend's car or whatever i didn't necessarily have my own you know what i mean so yeah, 2006, man, 23 years old, started my first shop, uh, still still know Gary, still hang out with him uh, here and there. Um, I'd still come by a shop every once in a while when I needed a special paint that he had or just shooting the shit or whatever. And at the time, he had another airbrush artist that had started working there. Uh, his name was John. He, had, he has a shop here in Dallas called Psychotic Designs, I think. And um, dude always was really good at skulls. He had a really cool, unique style. And so... Um, we ended up being cool and friends and he kind of did a couple jobs for me out of my shop and, um, him and Gary ended up having, you know, they ended up going their own separate right ways. And, uh, the dude, John's mom, like in, gave him a lot of money to start a shop. So this dude goes and gets a, a new paint booth and builds this, builds out this badass shop. And then we were doing a lot of work together. So he kind of reached out to me and was like, Hey dude, uh, would you be interested in being a partner in my shop? You know, you can handle all the, uh, he was basically wanting someone to do all the, the stuff, the the prep, the paint, the clear, basically do what Gary does. You know, he wants to basically come in with a fresh tank, fresh clear, fresh base coat, ready for his artwork. You know what I mean? And that's kind of where he was at. And so I was like, well, fuck it. Cool. You know, like I can't airbrush. So why am I going to try it? You know, I'll just do what I know how to do and he'll do what he does. And then I got work. He has work. Well, it sounds like a good partnership. He has the bad, the badass shop. So I ended up skipping out on my lease on the shop that I had, uh, maybe five months, four months, five months into it, and go out there and help them set up the shop. Had a couple bikes that I was doing. They were insurance jobs. Uh, ended up giving him the insurance check to put in the account. And uh, even to this day, I feel like such a bitch because when I went to him and asked him, like, hey, dude, I need to get paid this week or I need some money for gas, for this, for that, he kind of like was like, you know, straight like punked me basically he's like well i you know i didn't know that you were coming here to work i thought you were just coming to help me build the shop and i'm like dude i just handed you checks for these bikes and he goes yeah i thought you were paying me so you can work on them in the shop and i'm like why would i give you the whole fucking check just to work on it like how does that make any sense and he just kind of like shrugged his shoulders i was like wow so that was my first fucking like real fucking in the industry you know what i mean like just I left my shop. I had no shop to work out of. I can't go back to my grandparents' house because they decided to turn the garage into another bedroom. So I literally had to crawl back to the landlord of the lease I just skipped out on and basically beg him to let me back in. And fortunately, he did. The The next kicker, though, was that those two jobs, those two full repair jobs that I had to do, I had to do out of my own pocket, which if you just heard me say I didn't have any money, to do them in the first place because that's why I was asking him for money and when I found out I was getting fucked 
I had to go get back in the shop. So I had to take in like a couple of jobs and use the deposits to get back on my feet to get these jobs done. So it was like two or three months of like working with no financial income, you know, but like I said earlier, like out of these really, really low points in my life, something positive has came from it. So while I was working on one of those bikes, you know, um, the I was drop shadowing with the airbrush and then uh, there was a, like a little just a brown box sitting next to it. So I was kind of like checking the paint, you, you know, just spraying it on the box, make sure it was good. And I just started was doing some squiggly lines and then I just like drew a skull and it looked OK. Like it looked cool. I mean, it wasn't as good as the ones that Psychotic Designs were doing or other side customs were doing. But for me and my buddy at the time that, you know, I was telling you that I did the Camaro he, he would come hang out the shop every day and sometimes he'd help out or sometimes he'd just shoot the shit. He was like, damn, dude, that looks good. And I was like, it does, doesn't it? You know, and to this day, it, does, it did not look good. But to my eyes then, it was fucking awesome. And I was proud and I was like, fuck, man, like, wow. Like, I was so motivated that, man, I think I can do this, you know? So one thing that I've always kind of done in my career and uh, I might still do it today, I don't know. Maybe if I talk longer, I'll remember it, but I used to set these little small goals like I would make myself think, you know, one day, you know, when I first started painting, I was like, one day I'm going to be able to, you know, get a thousand dollars to paint a bike. And then one day it's going to be two. And then, you know, in the back of my head, it was always like, man, one day I'm going to be able to do ten thousand dollar paint jobs on bikes, you know. So it was like always these little small goals that you would work towards, you know, and they were kind of like the motivation that I gave myself to, to push forward through, you know, all kinds of different, you know, setbacks in my life or just through the motions, I guess you'd say. And, uh, yeah, man, it was, it was crazy, you know, like just the, the, the sense of like excitement of adding that to my arsenal, you know, like, like I said, I knew how to pinstripe and I knew how to lay out graphics and do all kinds of custom paint tricks. But now I'm officially a guy that doesn't need anybody else to do anything. Like I can do 100% of the job. And, you know, I didn't mention this, but when I worked out of that shop with Sissel, you know, uh, they had a vinyl cutter and they showed me how to use the vinyl cutting machine. And then, you know, so I kind of had those skills now, you know, I, I grew up doing AutoCAD. So I kind of, you know, it kind of crossed over to me a little bit. And so, you know, now I have the ability to cut, create logos on vinyl. Um, I had the airbrush thing that I was just learning and I just added to the deal and I was going to start pursuing that. And then of course the, the already custom paint shit that I was already doing. So it was a very exciting beginning to, to this, you know, this new direction in life, you know, uh, I was 24 at the time. Um, that summer prior to that in 2006, man, I, I ended up, uh, doing, getting my first magazine gig for uh, super street bike magazine. And uh, I wanted to tell everybody this because it's like, it's something that I've read. There's a famous airbrush artist named uh, Craig Fraser. If you're in the custom paint industry, I know you know who the fuck I'm talking about. But a long time ago, they used to have this, this message board called a Custom Culture Lounge. And in that message board, he had like an area where he had kind of a blog or something like that. And uh, it was talking about promoting your work. You know what I mean? And he had said something about like, you know, in magazines, which I don't know how much this applies now, but in magazines... You know, if you look in the editorial areas, you can find out the editors, the photographers. And then if you go onto websites, you can or just go online. You can search these photographers and, you know, just hit them up. Say, hey, man, I I see you do bike pictures for this thing. Would you be are you interested in shooting my bike? Uh, And most of these photographers would also scout and look for bikes to put in these magazines. So I found a guy. His name was Simon Green. You know, he was a he did a lot of motorcycle books. He was from like London and shit like that, or England. And um, he lived in you know a, a suburb of Dallas, Fort Worth. And I was like, well, fuck, like this is awesome. So the dude met up. I uh, told him about an idea of doing a, a how to custom paint uh, segment in their magazine, and he was into it. He sent it over to uh, whoever was in charge at Super Street Bike, and they approved it. And we ended up doing a, a full carbon fiber Hayabusa with a custom paint job over the top of it. And um, they photoed it, everything beginning to end in 2006. This was the summer, right when I started the shop that I was in before I left it. Sorry, I'm, I'm trying to stay in chronological order here, but I, I wanted to tell everybody about this. And uh, 
so it was cool to do that job and it, it was a two-part series in, in super street bike it came out you know one magazine had half another one had the other half and then we had a famous stunt rider that's still here uh in dallas worth his name was patrick stevens so we got him to you know get on the bike do some fucking burnouts and i don't know if he did a wheelie or not on it but it was a single-sided 360 hayabusa with full carbon fiber body work then we just did graphics and art on top of it so it wasn't even really a good accurate description of how to custom paint but it was visually pleasing to the to the magazine so they they ran with it but you know that was that magazine just came out right whenever i i you know got screwed out of that partnership and had to go back into my shop so the beginning of 2007 was like just it was catapulting you know what i mean um the airbrush thing uh the magazine which at the time like we were one of maybe one other person or shop in texas that had any kind of sport bike custom coverage of anything you know um it was still relatively new there might have been somebody but and i'm sure there was but I, i know i was one of at least two or three of the first people that had like magazine coverage for sport bike stuff here in texas and um it was 2007 man like it just you know i'm on cloud nine i i'm excited about airbrushing i'm trying to airbrush every day like i airbrush something every day so you know it's like to me i i progressed so quickly in the airbrush because i was so i have so motivated i was so hungry and i wanted it so fucking bad so in 2007 i was able to go from doing stick figure skulls is what I look at them and look at now to by the end of the year, I was actually doing some decent shit. You know what I mean? Or to now I I wouldn't say decent shit, but of the time it was cool. You know, this is also a time when, you know, around this time too is when tattoos, uh, in the tattoo culture was really kind of going from what it used to be with that more like Spalding catalog kind of you know, flash art that was on the wall to like where you got like Nico Hurtado and all these crazy badass airbrush. I mean, uh, tattooists, they were doing super realism, super badass shit. And so at the same time, is this right around when Corey St. Clair kind of coming started coming on in my radar in the scene because he was doing that kind of shit with airbrush. And there was already some amazing airbrush artists out there. I, I can name hundreds of them, but Corey brought this flavor to the style of airbrushing that was like way different than the lowrider scene of like the Fonzies and the and the OG Abels and and all these other guys like he brought a style that was different so airbrush at the time I felt like 2007 ish was like a pivotal point of it becoming what it is to now where you have this crazy realism this crazy badass look to where before you know you could get away with doing stick figure skulls and it was cool you know um yeah, but man, 2007, man, like I said, it was a weird, it was a great year, you know, and uh, I started getting real money. I was starting to get $2,500 to paint bikes, sport bikes and shit. I ended up doing like a, a race car and, you know, fully sculled out race car. It was a Mustang. I, I think I posted maybe a year ago on Instagram or something, but it was just crazy, man. It was, I was so hungry, man. I would, all I wanted to do was eat, sleep and shit art. I mean, I still rode bikes that, you know, still was into motorcycles big time, but the 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 airbrush skill coming along and becoming something that I can pursue was super motivational, you know. And at the time, I had a 2002 Jixer 1000, and uh, there was a shop up in like PA area, uh, tricked out custom cycles or something. They had did this sport bike, man. It was like it was, it was a spawn theme bike. So I'm a huge comic book fan, so that bike spoke to me as it was. But it was an O2 Jixer 1000. They took a Hayabusa headlight and molded it in. And they took a tail section off of a uh, an 03 1000 and made that work on the older uh, subframe. And, you know, had a big tires, had spinner wheels, all this crazy shit. I mean, at this time in my life, I wasn't really financially capable of going and building custom motorcycles. You know, like I made enough money to live and, and stuff like that. I wasn't a drinker. I didn't party. You know, I was more of an art nerd where I was like more just focusing on art all the time. Like, you know, when I started airbrushing, it kind of brought into the concept of wanting to do canvases and, and, and other things like that. So it really opened my eyes to a lot of different things. And, and motorcycles kind of took, I wouldn't say a backseat, but they de- they definitely weren't the most important thing going on in my life at the time, you know. Uh, you know, like I've said before on these podcasts, man, like motorcycles, 
at that time in my life was just an accessory of my lifestyle. It wasn't my life yet. You know, like, yes, that's what I did for fun. I had fun. It was necessary to go through all that shit, but it wasn't nothing of what it is today to me, you know. But I kind of lost my track there of where I was going with that. But, you know, I I ended up having, oh, yeah, I had the Shiksha 1000. I ended up, it was the first bike that I ever, you know, I took the motor out of it. And I completely did the bike from the ground up, or at least my version of it, what I can afford. Uh, Brock's had just kind of started, they were already out, but Brock's, you know, uh, I'm, I know you guys know who Brock's are. They're, they make those sidewinders for fucking uh, sport bikes. And then they also had like, you know, they do swing arms and shit for like the Harley Dyna market and stuff like that. But back in the day, like they were making these, you know, race pipes. So, you know, that shit looks so cool. So I ended up buying one of those. I had a friend that had there was a dealer with him and I did a lot of work out of their shop so he was able to give me some parts at some dealer costs and shit like that. Or I think I painted a bike for him for a, a, a Brock which are like 12 or 1300 bucks. So I ended up building that bike and you know that that dude Simon Green the photographer I told you about he he really dug it, you know, I I airbrushed everything on that fucking bike like a, the solid fucking airbrush. But it had a nice little swooping graphic flow to it. And uh, it was crazy because I remember that bike ended up getting like copied by a lot of other painters here in Dallas Fort Worth for a couple of years to come. But also, you know, going through this whole time and we we didn't, you know, so my space was kind of out, but it wasn't like a very big tool for marketing or, or selling yourself as a painter, builder or whatever. Even though it was how I saw like guys like Corey St. Clair and how I saw guys like uh, tricked out custom cycles. And some of the cool shit that people were doing in the industry that weren't in my backyard, but it still wasn't quite the tool that it is today. You know what I mean? So, but we did have something here in Dallas Worth called Sonic, or it was a Sonic, you know, drive through kind of place, but it was a huge bike night that, that, that has shaped my views of how to operate a bike night and run a bike night. It was, it was on one side of town and motherfuckers from every part of DFW went to it. It didn't matter if it was a 50 mile drive, a hundred mile drive. People went there every Thursday, no matter what. You didn't have to. You didn't have to promote it. You didn't have to ask if anybody was going to be there. You just showed up, and the fucking place was five, six, seven hundred dollars, seven hundred uh, bikes deep. And that's kind of like the way I've always wanted to structure a bike night for ourselves. The way we've been trying to structure the our DFW Dyna Crew thing. Um, but you know, all I had to do to promote myself was be there every Thursday. You know what I mean? And, and I did, and that's kind of where I got all my business from. And that's how I got kind of known here locally to do paint work. Um, you know, I had this bike that I built for myself and, you know, it got put in the magazine and I was doing bike shows with it and, and, you know, the bike nights and all that crazy shit. And it was, it was a good time man. it was, it was fun. And like I said, it was free advertisement for the most part. Uh, I ended up having another bike that, that we did too, uh, that came out. So I ended up having like three or four magazine features in super street bike right in that, that 2007 air era. And, um, it really kind of catapulted me and gave me a, a, you know, a name, uh, here locally. And, uh, by the end of 2007, man, like I was able to, uh, you know, me and Gary at other side customs started getting kind of cool again. And he, uh, he reached out or I reached out or something. I think I got overwhelmed, I think is what it was. I think it got to a point where I had so much work and so much deadlines and so much this and so much that that I was just like, you know, overwhelmed. And I just like wanted to go work somewhere and just clock in and clock out, right? So I reached out to Gary and he ended up hiring me back. He was kind of having issues with the airbrush artist he had at the time. And he goes, man, I'll hire you in to come do the airbrush work. So, you know, it's 2000, it's the beginning of 2008, you know what I mean? And so four years after I took that job, wet sanding parts for $320 a week, I mean, yeah, a week, four years later to the dot, to the January, I was working in the number two position in his business, you know what I mean? Like uh, airbrushing all these bikes, these bikes for strokers, all this crazy shit. Like I'm, I'm doing the bikes that are going in these magazines and all this crazy shit. And it was like, it was, you know, and, and I associate it to all that fucking, that dedication and that hard work that I did in 2007 of trying to develop that craft of airbrush work, you know? Um, yeah, it was, it was a crazy man. It was crazy to go back there. It was very, uh, it was icing on the ego cake, if that makes sense. <laughs> so, you know, uh, 
still developing all that shit going on. But, you know, I, I ended up taking that job and, you know, I, I uh, ended up like really buckling down. I'm 25 years old. I buckled down and started like trying to be responsible. I got insurance on my car for the first time. I, I got my own cell phone finally instead of using like my chick's phone and her own shit. And I got my first apartment, you know what I mean? And uh, and ever since then, I've been a pretty responsible guy. But up until that point, I just, you know, I was, you know, chick's couches, you know, homeboy's couches, you know, family's place, you know, I just wasn't, I was trying to figure shit out or whatever, but it, it was still, I was still a piece of shit. You know what I mean? Um, but no, I went back to work for Gary. I think I was only making like maybe 600 bucks a week, you know, but at 25, I was like stoked. I was like, fuck yeah. You know what I mean? I was like, I can do it. I can live off this. You know, I think the apartment I ended up getting was like $800 a week or a month. So I was able to like, f- like learn how to budget myself and learn how to get by on only spending this and spending that. Um, it isn't like today where I can go to the fucking gas station and drop $10 three times a day on fucking monsters and, and, you know, bullshit, you know, bag of peanuts and stuff. You know, back then it's like, fuck, you know, it's, it's, I got a hundred bucks to get me through the week. You know what I mean? And it it taught me a lot of lessons that I I wish I could, um, I'd like to go back and try to revisit those ideas and lessons and get my shit back together because I'm pretty frivolous when it comes to spending money sometimes, but you know, it was a good. It was it was just a good growth year for me to, in in two thousand eight. You know, I I ended up getting a car. I ended up financing a car. Uh, I think what happened was, see, at the beginning of two thousand eight, also uh, my daughter came back to live with me from my you know first relationship, and uh, I was able to uh, use the income tax return from her, and it kind of gave me like twenty five hundred bucks or something like that. So I was able to go put like a thousand dollars down on a car and uh then i was also used a thousand of it to pay off some of my credit so i can get an apartment so i used all that to kind of get my life together and then uh at the time you know i had sold that that bike that i built from in 2007 and then uh, my grandfather had co-signed on a 2006 jixer 1000 for my uncle and then my uncle wasn't really feeling it anymore so he they just let me take over the payment so i had a 2006 1000 i was paying like 240 bucks a month for it so I had that payment, I had the car payment, I had the the apartment and all the utilities. And then it was just me and my daughter, man, like every day. Like I barely ever rode. This is like a part of my life where motorcycles probably took the biggest back seat. Uh, I mean, I'm still really off the high of learning how to airbrush and learning how to push that. So, you know, working at Gary's and getting to airbrush every day was a pivotal thing as well because it was able to help grow my skills out and, and really push it for, forward. But also... Like I said, I'm I'm a natural uh, marketer, promoter kind of person. Like that's my personality. So quickly, you know, being at car shows the year before, I started to get to know the other like different people in town that had, you know, that did car sh- like custom cars or low riders and shit like that. So uh, ended up uh, weaseling my way into um, some other like local low rider shops, man, and and some car guys. So I started laying out flames on cars after work, you know, started laying out, you know, patterns and shit like that for low rider shops, uh, after work, you know, and it was crazy. Cause like, I'd go pick up my daughter from school. And then once we, I picked her up, then I would drive across town to this shop and then we'd start laying out graphics and doing this. And, you know, she'd be hanging out and we'd just be there until 10 o'clock at night. You know what I mean? It was, it was a, you know, I said the other day, I was talking to someone, I was like, man, I, I grew up with my daughter and that's that's the truth, man. Like her living with me, when she was born, it definitely put me on a more responsible path. But even though I still had my fair share of irresponsible things I did, it was still a lot more responsible than I know like some other thing people in my life. But when she came to live with me, I sacrificed all the things that I enjoyed and was the most important for her because I knew that I couldn't ride bikes every day. I couldn't be a motorcycle thing. So needless to say, I, it was a good time to be able to focus on art and focus on uh, getting better at airbrush work and getting, you know, just whatever I can do, whether it was a hood mural or a canvas or anything, man. Like I ended up getting really big into just art in general. And, and of course, my girlfriend on and off at the time, like she was an art history major at school. So I had that reinforcement of her and what she was interested in. And, you know, we kind of had that common ground there. And, 
you know, and I, I kind of got started doing some canvases here and there and started getting to go to art shows and started hanging out at, you know, within the art community. And, and it kind of was, was fun to do that stuff for a while. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, 2008 was, was good, man. Like it, it, you know, 2007 was that year that catapulted me in a lot of different ways, but 2008 was like when I got my shit together, you know, and, uh, needless to say, you know, like doing all the side work that like I was just mentioning, uh, eventually took its toll on my, uh, ability to 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 give gary the type of quality of work that i needed to be giving him because that was my job you know what i mean so i ended up getting fired again (laughs) and uh you know and at the same time and i ended up it was good because all the shops i was doing work for i had plenty of places to go work out of that had plenty of work for me so i was kind of like i had already developed uh kind of like a side hustle to where i can make it on my own if i had to so i was able to keep the apartment i didn't I, i I've got excellent rental history now, <laughs> all the way up until this day. But I was able to stay there. I lived out the lease, ended up moving closer towards a, a part of town where, you know, I ended up opening up my next shop uh, through a friend. Um, I used the shop that that did cars. I kind of went to his shop and did some stuff out of there. And he they kind of hired me for like six or seven hours a week. And it was, I was able to, you know, to make it off that and start my other business off that. So I, you know... My shops used to all be called Live Fast. It was either Live Fast Airbrush and Design, Live Fast Customs, Live Fast something. You know what I mean? It's always been my my uh, just direction of names, I guess you'd say. But it was uh, it was cool, man. 2009 was the next year, man. Another one. Fucking 26 years old. You know, I'd always told myself, like, I gave myself the, the, the age of 28. If I haven't figured out, if I'm not making real money by 28 doing all this custom paint shit, then I was just going to go back to college or some shit or go find a trade school or something, you know, like that was kind of like my cutoff and, and I got honey dicked into it basically. So the closer I got to 28, the more money I was making, but you know, the more responsibility and the more stress and the more of a pain in the ass that everything became. But I later realized, or I realized today that, you know, it's like, no matter how it, like how far your career goes, all the problems and ob- obstacles that you put in front of you are, are are in front of or are in front of you. That's hard to say. They don't ever go away. Like they just evolve and they become new obstacles and new problems. So the there's not really this point in time. I don't think. Maybe if you just hit the lottery or something. But I'm sure that's a, another set of problems. But I just don't know if there's a point in time where those things don't exist. And I think that the older you get, you know, you kind of find ways to eliminate them or you just find ways to cut them out of your life in certain ways but being young and and taking in money and taking in jobs taking in whatever you can to make some money you know you end up coming with a lot of problems and a lot of dealing with a lot of shit you know what i mean so it's kind of a pain in the ass but i'm probably not doing it justice in that thought but you know it is what it is anyway getting back on track sorry i don't need to be trying to tell you guys how to live your life (laughs) but anyway yeah, so 2009 was crazy, man. I ended up finding and getting back in my own shop and building that up. And I, I didn't really have a custom bike. I had that that Jixer that I talked about, and I was riding that around. And then, you know, like I said, I was more focused on paint and, and that stuff than anything. So I, I didn't quite have that same desire to ride. And, you know, um, it, it was just different, you know what I mean? So I ended up selling that Jixer, and my mom had bought a Sportster in 2007, uh, one of the Nightsters when they came out. So I was kind of like found myself borrowing that all the time to the point where I just ended up taking over the payments on that and was riding that every day or a lot. And, um, you know, it's uh, it was crazy. Also, you know, in 2009, it's like when me and Gary really started having beef. Like, you know, I've at this point, I'm kind of like I, I've built up a name for myself. I'm known in the sport bike scene as far as custom paint and, and slightly for building cool bikes or whatever. Um, and it it, it was kind of like a threat to Gary, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know his side of the story. Maybe one day he'll get in this podcast and we can talk about it. But, you know, I don't really understand, you know, the real issue he had. But the dude went to the links of, like, getting on some message board. And, like, he just created this, like, like I said, he has that charisma where people want to be around him. So he just... He created this big group of fucking people that just hated me, you know, and whether it was because I had an ego or whether it was because I was, you know, whatever the case may be, or maybe I deserved it. I don't know. But ever since 
2000, the end of 2000, you know, I guess right around 2008, once I left his shop or, or got fired, it's like I've always had that that constant, you know, having to prove myself to people that's never met me. You know what I mean? It, it's really hard to explain. But like here in DFW, you know, like I said, Gary's been painting bikes for since 1996 or seven or eight or nine. You know, he's he's well established, well known. He has a lot of respect from a lot of people in the sport bike and the Harley scene. And so when he starts saying that I'm a shitty dude or I'm this or I'm that, then everybody fucking, you know, like, I guess he's right, you know, and um, it just it sucked to have to. And that's why I don't I don't talk bad about anybody, you know, publicly or I try not to say anything even privately. You know, I try to always reinforce quality, you know, just people in, in, a, in a positive way, because the struggles that I had to go through of trying uh, of dealing with having someone with so much pool, you know, bashing my name and my, my character and my, my my work was was super stressful it was super draining it was it was a real emotional battle and it's always been um i mean it gets worse <laughs> so um yeah 2008 man it was it was a bad deal like there's lots of be there's a point in time where you know i went to sonic one day because everybody was supposed to be there to kick my ass and i mean i went there solo ready to get my ass kicked or you know at least go down swinging you know what i mean all over some chat room shit you know what i mean and it was it was a crazy it was a crazy fucking time but you know, uh, it's just is what it is, man. Like it's it's it was part of that story of me, you know. But 2009, man, it was crazy. You know, uh, me and my chick at the time, uh, we had been together like you know we were going on it was 2009, so we were about five years into our relationship, and it was kind of like I said, it was off and on, up and down, you know, good, bad, good, bad, and uh, we ended up deciding to break up. And the next day, we found out she was pregnant. And, uh, so that kind of forced us back together for the most part. And, um, it was, uh, it was good, man. Like that part of our relationship where she was pregnant and, you know, she, she was just awesome to be around. It was, it was a good point in time. And, you know, it was, it was July, I think. And we found out and then, uh, we had the shop and then the closer it got to, you know, my son, which is this one, he, he was being made, in the oven um he was supposed to be you know born in april and then you know i had this shop it was going great i still had all the beef going on and all that drama and all this bullshit and uh right around january of 2010 you know um it it was like i i i don't know what it was oh i was renting a shop and uh the shop the guy was like some little rich kid and his Dad gave him this badass shop to build cool cars and trucks and built a dirt bike track and, you know, all this crazy shit. And then they, you know, their his shop kind of flopped and that so they just had the empty building, said that I could rent it out, had a badass paint booth in it, all kinds of crazy shit, you know. Like really putting my shit on the map, you know, at this point. And I think that's why the the beef with me and Gary got big, because now I have a a real fucking shop, like a real shop with a paint booth and whoops. A real shop with a real paint booth and I'm a real player in the game now. And I think that's where a lot of the animosity came from Gary and other side customs of wanting to kind of like diminish my name and diminish my uh, skills and abilities. So, you know, I understand it. I mean, he like I said, Gary's an old school cat. So he has that old school mentality of, you know, fuck that shop across the street because we do the same thing, you know, which obviously is something that we don't have to really deal with nowadays because, you know, we all pull work from all over the country now. So back in the day, we were trying to pull work out of the same pot, which I get it. You know, I'm not saying that he, that I agree with the way he went about, you know, bashing me. And I'm definitely not good at, I, I wasn't, you know, it, it was stupid of me to try to defend myself, you know, verbally or physically if, if it came to that, you know what I mean? It was just really dumb to even get, go down that path of trying to prove to people that don't like you that they should like you, you know what I mean? But yeah, man, 2010. So basically, after 2009 and all the drama with Gary and him, you know, talking shit and and just being an asshole, you know, I I, I was like, I lost the, the shop. Like, I, that's what I was saying. The, the shop I was at, man, they just, uh, the the landlord, you know, he, he was that rich kid, man. He just kind of like threw me under the bus 
which I hate to say this, man, because when you talk back on it, it's like, man, this guy fucked me. That guy fucked me. I mean, there's got to be me doing something wrong here, right? It's just, it's too, it's too many people that did me wrong for me to act like I didn't do something to, you know, something, something I said, something I carried myself a certain way or something I didn't fall through with on my end. Something happened. You know what I mean? So it, whatever the case was, I had to, you know, leave the shop um, and, you know, so I reached out to Gary after all this shit, all the shit he talked and how he said I was the worst painter and horrible airbrush artist. Motherfucker hired me back again to do all the custom paint in his shop. <laughs> so that was a well calculated thing on my part, because I figured, you know, if you think I'm the worst guy in the world and you told everybody out there that I was such crap, why would you hire me back to do the number one job? in your shop (laughs) so needless to say i feel like i won the battle uh as far as that's concerned and and like i said i have a respect for gary regardless of how much drama or beef we've ever had i mean the dude brought me down this path in life to where i'm here right now being able to talk to you on this podcast you know so even though we might not agree it's there's still a love that i have for the man just for you know just for so many reasons like what I just, you know, said. So, you know, I'm able to put all that shit behind me and just focus on, you know, what we can do now that, you know, I have the skill set of this point now and whatnot and and the name and this, that, and the other. So, you know, like I said, uh, at this point in time, I'm starting to build bikes. I'm starting to do a lot of big fat tires on sport bikes and, and, um, you know, uh, it was going good, man, and I, I took the job back. Uh, this time, that guy, Mike Sissel, that I was telling you about that had the shop that we worked out of, he was doing the airbrush work as well in the shop. But, you know, at this point in time, you know, which is crazy because considering, what, 2008, they had all that big crash, we never really felt it here in DFW, or at least I didn't, and I know Gary didn't. But in 2010, man, like I said, we, Gary's shop was booming. I had a, a huge clientele. I literally brought my paycheck to work with me every week. You know what I mean? So, you know, we were building bikes and uh, out of this shop, I was painting them, doing the stuff that was more close to the style of my work. And then Cecil was doing a lot more of the the detailed, very f- like precise type airbrush work that I'm just not capable of doing. You know what I mean? So it was a good dynamic. You know, uh, it was great. I had a lot of clientele, like I said. So I was able to pretty much just, you know, I pretty much just needed a place to do my own work, and that's pretty much what was happening. I had plenty of work. Uh, I think I I think I saved everything I brought into his shop that year. And uh, mind you, this time I, I went to work in January. Uh, my son was born in April, and I worked all the. I, this is the first time in my life I ever had a job for more than a year. So I worked there until um, 2011. It was probably. April, May, the next year, 2011, before, you know, I didn't necessarily quit, but um, in 2010, you know, like I said, me and my chick, we were kind of going back and forth a lot, but, you know, we had, when we had our son, it kind of brought us together pretty well, but once my son was born, um, mind you, my daughter also lives with us as well, so it's just me, my daughter, uh, my son's mom, and now my son, so we ended up renting a house, it was, it was an awesome house, Uh, ended up renting it, it had a garage and I set the garage up to basically do all my artwork because at this point in time, you know, motor, I wasn't a huge guy of, of riding bikes anymore. You know, it was kind of like 2008 to 2011. I was kind of just more focused on artwork and painting and whatever career wise, you know, that type of shit. So um, we ended up renting this house, uh, ended up turning the garage into like a little studio and I was doing a lot of artwork in there. I wasn't painting bikes in there or anything like that, but I was doing artwork on bikes and stuff for sure. And uh, so it got to a point with Gary where I was just like, dude, I'll just take, just give me whatever you need me to paint and I'll take it home and work on it in my comfort zone. And then I'll bring the shit back and you clear it tomorrow. You know, and that's what we ended up doing, which freed me up to basically be able to go work at all the other shops that I also did work for. Like uh, there was a shop called Torres Empire which uh, I ended up taking a job later on. We'll get to that. But they did a lot of lowrider stuff. Torres, or Sam Torres is, was a huge help in my life. You know, he a uh, big lowrider guy. He puts on a, the lowrider super show in L.A., downtown L.A. 
uh, actually the first year that they ever did that, I was actually working for him and I was there and I got to meet a lot of badass fucking painters and artists from that. But I'll get to that point. But 2010, you know what I'm saying? We, me and my wife, or not wife, my, my son's mom, we ended up getting that house. Uh, we were renting it. Uh, it was an awesome place. Uh, my brother at this time was kind of, you know, my brother started working for me here and there when he was 13. And he would sand parts and do this and do that. And he got to a point before 2010 where he was actually, he could buff. You know what I mean? He could buff parts out. So he was buffing bikes for me and shit like that. And uh, he would come over to the house and stay for a couple of days and help me out with shit. And then, you know, he was just kind of, you know, he was 16, 15, 16 years old. So he was kind of like around all the shit that's kind of going on and stuff. But, you know, towards the end of 2010, man, like me and my chick just, it just wasn't working. You know what I mean? It, it was kind of like the house was separate. It was me and my daughter and my son's mom and my son. And um, it just didn't feel right. So uh, it was, it was just, it, the end of the year was just, it was over. Like our shit was done. Um, she ended up moving out. Uh, and the crazy thing is my daughter's mom ended up getting her life together. And so, you know, my daughter went to go live with her mom. So, you know, all of a sudden, January 2011, I'm single. I have a dope ass fucking pad. And I have no kids, you know, I'm just like dumped out into the world like, you know, and I, I didn't really have a bike. I kind of had the sports drill when it was, but I wasn't super big into the bike stuff. And then, you know, living in that house and the friends that I did have that I was close to, we started, they all kind of was coming over. We started throwing parties, you know, and, and we ended up paying, I ended up painting a bike on the side. And that's when I started, you know, when I, when I lived, when I was with Gary and I started doing the work from home, I started to keep the work that I was taking to him at home. And I was just doing the shit on my, my own. And I painted this sport bike for this chick and uh, her husband ended up being a cool dude. And uh, later on, we, me, that chick, and that dude, we ended up starting a bike club together, <laughs> which we'll get to that. But being in 2011, man, like I said, it was a new, it was weird, man. But it was my first taste of like actually having money, kind of, freedom. And I had a skill set that I could sell to just about anybody. So, you know, I had the work coming from Gary, so I was able to do good with that. But you know, and then I started getting more and more work from this Torres Empire place. And they did, like I said, they did a lot of low riders. So I was getting hood murals and stuff like that. And then they started building a, a, a 59 Impala that they were going to take to SEMA for, uh, it was going to be in the dub booth. And so they hit me up and we started talking about it. And then they were also getting into a new shop. So I was doing kind of did a lot of murals on walls at the time. So I was putting murals of their shit all over the walls and doing the bikes. Ended up they ended up just like hiring me and I just did a job. I started working for them and, you know, Gary was kind of butthurt about it, but you know, he still was sending me work here and there. And, uh, you know, I was working there. I was painting the bikes out of their shop and, you know, I got to go to California for, it was the second time I ever went to California, but the cool thing was I got to go to California this time. We got to take the Sportster and then one of the guys that was working kind of always worked for me that helped me out. His name was Min. He was a little Asian kid. He was a fucking cool ass kid for a while, and then he ended up turning into an asshole. But <laughs> that's a that's another story. Uh, but you know, he was cool, man. He I, he built a really sick ass R one, and he took it with him. And I had my little Sportster that was my mom's, and we were ripping around in uh, L A. Went through Echo Park and down to Venice, and just crazy shit, man. I rode Sunset all the way down to where it, it dumps out onto the PCH, and it was that was the first time I ever got to ride a bike in in California. It was 2011, but we were we were there for the lowrider super show that that Torres Empire was putting on and um it was the first lowrider show that LA was letting be take place in downtown LA in like 10 or 12 or 15 years or something crazy like that so it was a big deal and you know I'm you know social media was kind of like more just Facebook was kind of the only thing I'm MySpace kind of phased out at this point so there was artists and like Steve Deman and and uh, Fonzie and OG Abel and uh, I don't really know how to say his name, but I think it goes by Quality Art on uh, Instagram. There was a lot of badass artists that were there, you know, uh, Steve Batista or Dave Batista, whatever the fuck his name is. A lot of a lot of cool shit. I got to meet a lot of cool people. It was, it was badass being on staff with with Torres Empire for that type of stuff. Also, uh, 
earlier that year, you know, Taurus Empire had threw a show in Dallas and uh, they had Ice Cube come down and, and all this. And mind you, this is a time in my life where I did canvases a lot. So I was painting. I found it's crazy now that I'm thinking about this, but I used to do canvases of like like rappers and and fucking shit like that because it was like pop culture. So when I went to these lowrider shows and they saw a canvas of somebody they know, they wanted to buy it. So I did one of uh, Lil Wayne and uh, it was like everybody fucking loved it. You know what I mean? And this is kind of like just a real oversized portrait of, portrait of Lil Wayne. And then I did some of like I did one of Rihanna and I would do these live at car shows. So people would like freak out about it. And uh, so I did one of Rihanna and then the car show they had here, they had uh, Ice Cube was was one of the people they hired to do it. So I got to meet him and and I did a canvas of Ice Cube and then he signed it. And then I ended up selling it to uh, to Sam. He ended up buying it from me for like a thousand bucks or some shit. So it was was pretty cool. And also the good thing about that show was uh, I got to get a feature in um, Lowrider Art. So they did a feature on me and all the canvases and art that I was doing at the time. Uh, I mean, mind you, at this time, man, like Day of the Dead Chicks and Roses and Skulls, all this shit was like super popular shit. So it's like you really could do no wrong. You, if you put a girl and you painted her face to look like some Day of the Dead shit, then that shit sold. You know, like clothing culture was really big into that. And and then, you know, a lot of tattooists would also do paintings on the side. So it was just, I think it was a really big art movement blow up kind of thing. You know what I mean? So, but the other thing, the kind of embarrassing thing about 2011 and, and doing all this shit was, uh, you know, this is when like Sons of Anarchy started getting kind of more mainstream popular. It had already been going on, but it was like now I'm like I, I've never been a TV watcher. I don't really care. I, I, don't, I don't. I just don't do a lot of that shit. So I I don't really watch a lot of TV. Never have. But when that show came out, you know, and then like I said, I started having. I was single and I started partying more, and then I had my first beer too. I was, you know, let's see what was I in 2011. I was 28 years old. So this is when I'm my cutoff in life that I made for myself, but in 2011, man, I, I was 28, I had my first beer that I actually drank, it was a Dos Equis, you know what I mean, so if you listen to this podcast, you know I listen, I, I drink a lot of Dos Equis, and it's only because of that, I guess, I guess it's the first beer you ever take is the one you like the most, or something, I don't fucking know, but that's what I love, and I remember, because that's when the Mavericks, the Dallas Mavericks were at the, uh, they were, they won the championship that year, and while I was there, I had a Dos Equis, because my friend Chris, that I told you I slept on his floor forever, he was like, man, you'll probably like this beer. And then I did, and that's what I've been drinking ever since. So before that, I was a margarita guy when I would drink. I didn't drink much, but every once in a while, I'd have a drink. Um, but yeah, it was crazy, man. Like I said, we we had the party house, and and we were doing lots of parties. And you know, like I said, with Facebook kind of out, like it was easy to kind of get girls to come through. And then that couple that I did that bike for, they would come hang out and then we'd all get drunk as fuck, be at the house and we start talking about like, man, we should start a bike club, blah, blah, blah. And uh, we fucking did, <laughs> you know, but needless to say, man, that was, it was a, it was a pivotal year again for me, you know, cause you know, I had, I had made a, I had built a bike for a friend of mine. That's a real close friend of mine to this day. His name was Brandon and I built a, 06 Jixer 1000 big ass 360 on the back the motherfucker had LEDs like a goddamn 18 wheeler man it was just it was lit up it was crazy it was flashy it was everything that that was cool to me at the time because mind you at this point in time motorcycles are more of, of a possession a, an accessory a, a, a you know a thing it wasn't my life it was just something that I did and it was something I was a part of but it wasn't quite there yet I think that you know, going into like me talking to you about the motorcycle club that I was a part of and helped start, those kind of things helped shape helped shape my real passion for motorcycles in the long run because it painted and I started looking at motorcycles in a much, much different light than before when I was just trying to make them look good to go to, you know, the local fucking Sonic bike night or car shows to, to get my name out there or just to be seen and, and get likes or whatever you want to call it. But like I said, there was a party house, man. Uh, you know, that was the first year I got to go to California on a bike. I didn't ride. We we took an eighteen wheeler all the way out there. Um, later on, we like I said before, we were doing this fifty nine Impala, so we were banging that out to go to SEMA. So it was the first year I got to go to SEMA. 
Um, I didn't necessarily go to work or anything, but I did get a, the opportunity to airbrush on the wall at SEMA. And it was cool because there was a couple of airbrush artists there that were real famous that actually knew who I was. So it made me, it, it kind of reinforced my, you know, insecure insecurity of like feeling like, okay, is this, should I continue to do this? Is this good? Is, is this really, you know, my path or where I should be going or whatever you want to call it? So, um, it was a good thing to go there, but I also made the statement there. I realized there that I didn't want to go back to SEMA until I was invited for some form or fashion or some reason. You know what I mean? So needless to say, we got home and then uh, the the friend of mine I just mentioned, Brandon, that we built that bike, he does he did like military contracts. So he was like here for three months and then gone for six months. So when he was gone, like I kept his bike for him for the most part, you know, like we'll do maintenance on it, do some more work to it or whatever he just left it at my house all the time so you know um i ended up selling that sportster from my mom and uh i also ended up moving out of that house and then i got my deposit back and so with that selling the sportster and the deposit i was able to go buy me a new bike which i went you know all my friends at the time we were all riding sport bikes still even though i was kind of on a harley for a minute so we uh I went and bought me my favorite Jixxer of all time, which I literally just posted a picture of me on it uh, yesterday, but it's an 03 Jixxer 1000. And so I got that. And at the time, we used to do so many 240 kits and 300 kits that I was really close with the company, The Roaring Toys. So I was able to get a deal on a, on a swing arm kit. So I was able to order that. Um, and so I had the swing arm, the bike, put it all together. I didn't really build the bike yet, but it was like the start. And then another like this club that we started like it was called live fast mc I'm real creative right i know fucking lame as fuck but it was called live fast mc and we started it in december of 2011 and uh the kicker was man like all of us had custom bikes or we were all in the process of building custom bikes but by the time april rolled around all of us had 240 kits we were all fucking led'd out fucking all that shit that i think is super gay now but I was doing it, you know, and I, I think that, you know, it, it was it was fun, man. Like, it, it was just fun starting that club. It was exciting. It was just as exciting as it was when I fucking found out I could airbrush. You know what I mean? Like your mind's racing with all kinds of different, you know, like possibilities and thoughts. And like, man, I, I might be able to do this. Or what if we get so big that we were like this or, you know, whatever, you know, and it's like it was fun. You know what I mean? It was good. And, and when I tell you that club evolved from like I did it, it was exactly five years that I did that. And then um, I grew so much in that five years, you know what I mean? And that that's from 2011 till 2016. That was, man, that, that club took me places. I took it places. It changed me. It, it brought really great people into my life. Like even though it didn't work out in the long run, I'm so fucking happy it happened. You know what I mean? I really am. Um but yeah, so 2011 at the end of December we started that club, and then that we kind of we kind of hit the ball, you know, hit the ground running in 2012. You know, uh, my buddy that I was telling you about Brandon that we had did that bike for that he kept at my house. Uh, he wanted to invest in into me and give me a shop and this that and the other. So remember that same shop I got kicked out of because of the rich kid. Well, we ended up going back there and. Uh, renting it you know all legit business account credit card machine you know brandon brought the real stability to to my career as far as business wise is concerned and we started this business and you know we were selling parts we were painting bikes and man we were booming getting it right uh, i ended up building out that jixer that i told you i just posted online i, I ended up building it out probably at this point, I had a little bit more money to spend on bikes, and I was a lot more meticulous about how I would do things. So I went through that whole bike, and man, you couldn't look in a nook and cranny on that bike and not see brand new something or painted or refinished something. It was just a clean bike. And uh, yes, I only had one brake on it. It was only the front rotor, that's it. I wanted you to see that back wheel and that side of the front wheel. But, um, you know, we built that bike. I finished it up just in time to ride it down to to Austin for... Uh, we used to always go down to Austin for the Texas Relays, which was a kind of a big sport bike thing. You know what I mean? And uh, because we had a woman in our club and uh, because we had also, you know, a mixed race, you know, we had some black guys, some Mexican guys, this, that, the other. 
you know, uh, when we, we went and did all the channels to get our club sanctioned, we had to kind of fall under the minority set uh, instead of going through what would be the COC of Texas. You know what I'm saying? So we kind of we did it right. I mean, we didn't just like put a patch on and start riding. We actually went through the channels. And because of me and being in the industry and painting and, and knowing a lot of people, like I kind of knew who to talk to and I kind of had the pass, you know, I guess you'd say. But we pulled it off, man. We started the club. Uh, we started the shop at the same time, which was also called Live Fast, which wasn't the smartest thing in the world. But between the club and all of us having custom bikes and the bikes that we were building and painting out of our shop, we were owning bike nights. You know, we'd pull up to bike nights and shut that shit down. And a huge ego booster. Now, trust me, it was, it was definitely that. And at this point in my life, I'm more of a partier, a drinker, a, you know, let's have a good time. Let's, you know, let's let loose and and all this, that, and the other. But I'm also at a point in my life where I make a little bit more money. Like I'm kind of, I think I'm more close to making around a thousand dollars a week or around something like that. So I'm a little bit more living a little bit more comfortably. And, you know, um, at this time I ended up moving back to my mom's house actually, while I started this shop because I needed the extra income while I was in this shop to be able to get by. And I didn't want to have to like pay $1,500 a month for a shop and fifteen hundred month dollars a month for a place to live. So I was just staying at my mom's house and then, you know, I was messing with this chick, so I would sometimes stay with her house or whatever, you know, sometimes go back to my baby mom's house. You know how it is. Uh so it was just one of those deals, man. I was just kinda like living a little gypsy gypsy ish at the time. And uh, you know, we had the shop and it was fucking booming up big time. Man. It was growing fast and uh you know, Gary, we're still cool, you know, other side of customs. And uh, he was uh, sending me bikes. So he would have his guy, like, come out there with a freshly painted bike. I'd lay out graphics on it, do some shit on it, do whatever. And then they'd come pick it up and take it back to the shop and clear it and all that stuff. And then uh, it basically came to a screeching halt about, you know, like I said, we started this in January. And uh, come May, I painted my first Harley on my own, my, Har- my first Road Glide like through my shop, the customer came to me, not to Gary. And uh, to this day, the guy that I did it for, his name's Blade, man. He's a good friend of mine. He's older cat, wisdom, good ass fucking dude. And he was like kind of the, he opened the floodgates to the Harley market for me. You know what I mean? I did that bike. I think I charged him like two grand and it was full candy, flaked out, real candy, not some KK shit, like UK candy, all done right. And uh, I did it all. And then at this time, too, like literally right after I finished that bike, um, the guy, uh, I don't know how familiar you guys are with some of the bagger stuff, but there was a shop called uh, Misfit um, out of Houston. And he had shut his shop down. He moved up to Dallas and he was working out of a shop called Pickard USA, which is kind of known for wheels and fenders and shit like that. So they were building a Road King. And he reached out to me and wanted us to paint it and do some crazy shit to it. And I did. And uh, that those two bikes made Gary like not fuck with me anymore. Like to this day, to this moment that I'm telling you this on this podcast, this dude will not even I've approached him twice, tried to shake his hand. He kind of respectfully does. But then just in any kind of way, just like, you know, he, he don't he does not fuck with me. Right. And it all happened just because I painted a Harley. Um, crazy shit. Uh, but no, we did this bike for, for Pickard and it came out and it was dope. And then literally a month later, oh, wait, let me back up just a hair. So we, uh, you know, we did that first road glide for my buddy Blade. And then I sold that sport bike I built, the orange one, and I bought my first, my first Harley, which was, it was a 2005 road glide. And this was at the time when Big Wheels was kind of making a big fucking, you know, it was really there. You know, they had been doing big wheels for a couple of years before, but it wasn't as mainstream as it was at this point. And 26s were a little bit more obtainable and affordable, and uh, it was just going. So I ended up buying that 2005 Road Glide. And then at the time, you know, like I said, we had the bike club still, you know what I mean? And all of us were on sport bikes. And we were all doing, we all had nice bikes. So we had a lot of outside friends that were kind of lingering and hanging out, wanting to be a part of the, uh, the fun, I guess you'd say. And um, one of them was a friend of mine that worked at a Honda dealership. And um, he was a like a master tech there, did a lot of work. He always helped me out with like front forks and stuff whenever I needed to take them apart to get them powder coated or something. 
And so when I told him why I sold my sport bike, because I think that he really started to like me and want to be my friend when I built that sport bike because he really liked it. You know what I mean? So that kind of made him want to be around me more or whatever the case may be. But when I told him I sold the bike and what I bought with it, he didn't really get it and understand. And then I showed him, I think it was like ballistic cycles. They had built like a 30 inch road king road glide and it had like some beak nose looking front end. And at the time it just looked cool. But you know, like I said, at this time, motorcycles weren't the same. They weren't what they are to me now. So I didn't look at them the way I look at them now. You know what I mean? Like they were just cool. They were just something to, to throw my money in and throw my talent on or whatever you want to call it or my skills or whatever. You know, they weren't like the vessel for my life, or whatever you want to say, you know. So um, I showed him what they could look like. And then he was like, dude, that's fucking crazy. It's nice. And dude went out and, you know, him and one of the dealerships, uh, one of the guys at the dealership, they went out and bought brand new 2012 road glides like that week. You know, and um, I was kind of I was jealous. I was like, fuck, man, like I want a brand new one. And then the good thing was my partner, Brandon, at the time, you know, he kind of saw that and he saw that that our business was going was literally went from April, May. We did that bike for that dude, Blade. And then June, July, we had five or six baggers and they were painting. And then we had like three sport bikes. So it literally with the changing of this of of the, 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 you know, from spring to summer, or summer to fall, it like that's how quick it went from like bagger or from sport bikes to baggers and then you know of course when i got me the 2005 and then you know brandon was home from uh from one of the the trips you know like like i said he did military contracts so he was looking into going to get one too a brand new one and he just set it all up so that basically i traded in my old road glide my 05 and we all bought brand new ones so all four of us had brand new 2012 road glides that we all picked up and um it was cool, man. Like, I rolled the piss out of that bike. You know, I think I put 10,000 miles on that bike in three months. Just, you could not get me off of it. And that's the first brand new anything I ever had in my life. So, needless to say, I'm, I'm you know, how old is I fucking... Hold on, here's my cheat sheet. <laughs> I am 29 years old. And I'm going to be 30 in September of 2012. Uh, and I felt like, you know the baggers and the Harleys and that shit was always like kind of thought of us as being old man with money bikes. You know what I mean? Like, so there was this really empowerment feeling of being 29 years old and having a brand new $20,000 motorcycle. That was, you know, my broke ass growing up, you know, that, that I felt like, fuck man, I'm, I'm making it like, this is, this is really happening or whatever you want to, you know, associate that with. So Come September, um, you know, the uh, the business was going good. Live Fast Customs was doing well. We were had plenty of work. Um, that dude that worked for Picker that I told you about, we painted that Road King for, he ended up parting ways with them, and then he went back out on his own and started Misfit Industries, which a lot of people know who that place is. And at this time, me and him were real close, and uh, we ended up painting a couple, like two more bikes for him for the following show, which was going to be Lone Star Rally in Galveston, which is in November. And this is right when Baddest Bagger, this is the first year Baddest Bagger was taking place. So this one of the bigger shows for the bagger industry. And so we did, he did the first, or I wouldn't say the first, but he did a lay frame 26 road King. It was called King's Ransom. I airbrushed skulls all over and over a pearl white, like Cadillac base. And it ended up getting best of show, best this, best that kind of blew us all up. You know, it ended up getting the cover of uh, baggers magazine it was crazy. Um, and, you know, at the same time, if we back up to September, that guy in the dealership I was talking to you about, uh, his name was Nick. He was a friend that I was riding with, hanging out with every day. He ended up prospecting in our bike club and all that shit. Uh, he worked at the dealership and then they, you know, the other guy that worked there that bought the brand new bike, his name was Demarcus. Um, they had a customer come in that had stupid money and wanted to start his own bike shop. And they were all hanging out and shit like that. So they got the idea, like, to want to leave the dealership and start their own business and whatnot. But they knew that I had already created something that had a lot of momentum with Live Fast Customs. So instead of them trying to go out on their own, they looked at it like, well, this DeMarcus guy was a salesman. Um, Nick was a master tech at the Honda dealership. And then I was a painter slash, you know, whatever you want to call me. So they reached out to me and said, hey, 
can we buy your partner Brandon out? And then let's we'll just invest money into you and start your business and, and we'll just kickstart the business that way. You know what I mean? And I was like, I was like, fuck, man, like that sounds good, you know, but I'm a very loyal person. You know what I mean? Like that's why today to this day I'm still like I would definitely go have dinner with Gary if he would if he would do it because I have respect and loyal, you know, I'm loyal to that guy, you know, and uh, whatnot. But so I didn't re- really want to like put Brandon out, you know, because Brandon gave me something that no one else did. Like he gave me a chance and he he invested in me. So but, you know, the offer these dudes were putting on the table, man, it was like 70 grand a year guaranteed salary. So taxes, all that shit. I, I was going to own shares in this company. Um, you know, they were bringing in a, a drag account and all the accounts to be able to sell. So I'd be able to sell all the shit that I needed to be able to sell, which is kind of one of the things I'm, I pride myself in and being a little bit good at, or I was at the time was, was selling full builds on bikes. And, um, you know, they, they reached out to me and I finally thought it over and talked to my friends or, you know, whatever. And so I said, I, I'll do it if, as long as you make sure that you pay out Brandon, hundred percent of what he invested into this company, which at the time I think was right around 10 grand. So I was like, so if you guys do that, then I, I agree to it. Um, and so they did. And, uh, you know, one big lesson learned for me on dealing with business was, you know, I created that live fast name, you know, here locally. And I created it when I started doing this shit on my own back in 2006, in my first shop. So even though that shop went under, it came up, it went under or whatever you want to call it. I just, I got overwhelmed. I stopped it. I started building that brand at that point in time. And so when they brought all this money in and, you know, for them to be able to do it, they had to give the DeMarcus guy all the, uh, he had to have the controlling interest of the company because he was the, he was the guy closest to the guy with the money. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm an old school dude, man. I'm from, I'm not from the hood, but I'm, I'm pretty close to it. So I got some hood qualities, you know what I mean? And my thing was, I was close with Nick and Nick was cool with the DeMarcus guy. And I, you know, Nick said DeMarcus was cool. So I'm taking Nick's word for it. You know what I mean? And that's something I, I would, I would always be more vocal about it now if I ever went into business with somebody else. But, you know, I just took Nick's word for it, but you know, they, they took over, you know, they, the Brandon signed over his part of the business in September, the end of September, and they everything took place at the beginning of November. And this is right when we went to Galveston for that uh, that Baddest Bagger show, and we won, even though the shit that we won was shit that I did before they ever came along and stuff, but it was just the company got a lot of exposure at that point in time. We had the cover of that, that bike came out on the cover the very next month, and then a month prior to that, the other two bikes I painted for Misfit had came out on a hot bike cover of a magazine. So I had two cover magazines on two of the biggest magazines for the bagger market at the time. So 2013 comes rolling around, you know, I'm 30 years old, you know what I mean? At this point in time, I'm, I got a brand new 2012 Road Glide. You know, the, the guy that, the money guy behind our company at this time, you know, he, he loans us all like five grand, like all three of us five grand to kind of put into our bikes and to fix them up. And, uh, I had already started building mine. I was, I was kind of debating going 23 or going 26, but then when he gave us all the money to kind of put into the bike, which it was a loan, then, you know, I was like, well, fuck, I'll go 26. And we had the dealer accounts. So I was able to get all the parts at cost. And, um, so I ended up building the 26 and this is my, my orange bagger that I built that was on the cover of American bagger. Um, you know, we had a lot of momentum going into that year, but, you know, they invested so much money into it. And the way that the guy DeMarcus was carrying himself, in my opinion, and like I said, I don't, I never wanted to use this podcast to say anything bad about people where they can't defend themselves. You know what I mean? So I try not to do that, but this dude was just a piece of shit. So fuck that. This dude was a piece of shit guy. He ended up I kind of I kind of peeped it, you know what I mean? Because we were we were all took a three way same check. Like we all took seventy grand a year. We all had the same check, so we all made the same money. All three of us. The money guy was just an investor. He wasn't like he was just trying to get paid off the the profit of the business at the end of the year, which you know was none. <laughs> so you know, um, 
And the other thing that was crazy is that, that the money guy was so blind in this DeMarcus guy who, mind you, when he worked at the dealership, had no car, nothing. This dude starts handing him $150,000 worth of you know, investment money here and there to go put into our bank account. And next thing you know, this dude's showing up to work with Versace fucking button-up shirts and Rolex watches and, and 40 pairs of fucking Ray-Ban sunglasses and all this crazy shit and taking trips all over the country. Mind you, me and Nick are at the shop working, you know, because the money that we're taking is is good money, no doubt, but we can't afford that type of shit. And so, you know, me and Nick would be talking, we'd be like working, like, what, this fucking dude's in Atlanta partying on, you know, my Instagram had already, had came out in 2011, no, 2012 for us, I don't, I mean, it probably was out before that, but in 2012 it was up, so that was kind of like Facebook was kind of the king, and then Instagram came on, and it kind of slowly worked its way into being like the more popular uh platform for us so we were all on instagram and you know this dude's on instagram posting shit partying drinking all this crazy shit you know stuff that we can't afford to do and he makes the same money so it started raising questions to me so the initial investment this guy put into our company was 150 grand and trust me if someone invested that kind of money into me i mean that was I, i just don't see how you know, it was gone within a month, you know, and I I didn't get it, you know what I mean? Because, you know, lo and behold, like our overhead per month, which this, this, this whole experience right now that I'm, I'm talking about taught me so much. It really did. And that's why I really wanted to emphasize like my thoughts and my process of going through this. But, you know, um, they invested 150 grand into that first one, right? So, between all three of our checks, the shop rent, uh, the over, you know, the, the, you know, the two employees that I already had before they came along that they were, they kept on, you know, they were only making like 600, 700 hours a week or something like that. So basically we had a $21,000 a month overhead, right? And we weren't, I wasn't making, I, I might've did 10 grand a month, just me and my two employees. And I wasn't, you know, like I wasn't taking home the money that I was taking now, but you know, so that's 21 grand. We did that for two months. That's 40 something grand right there for the first two months. It's a $150,000 investment. Uh, they invested 20 grand into, you know, like parts to put on the wall. Um, 20 grand into, you know, to a tire machine and, and a, a balancer and a couple other little tools here and there. But realistically, I'm seeing only $80,000 gone at the beginning, you know, from November to December of what's been invested in this company. But then, you know, it was the week between New Year's and Christmas and me and Nick were working, uh, getting ready because we were going to go to the V-Twin Expo, which was at the beginning or the end of January, the beginning of something. So we were working on, you know, some some display stuff and getting his bike dialed in and stuff like that. And fucking DeMarcus hits up and goes, dude, we need to make some money. We're fucking broke. I'm like, how the fuck are we broke? But see, they didn't give me and Nick any access to like bank accounts or be able to look or anything, right? It was all set up so that basically DeMarcus and the accountant that they were using, were they started embezzling money right at that moment. And so, you know, I kind of peeped it, but I was like, ah, you know, what's the alternative? You know, I might win this war, but I'm, fe- I'm I mean, I might win this battle, but I'm definitely losing the war. I'm going to be out of my own shop, out of all my equipment that I gave away to this, you know, investment, I, I would be fucked a hundred percent. So the, uh, you know, I just kept my mouth shut, you know, I just went with it, you know, and then they, I, I finished my bike right before April, uh, right before March. Right. So March, you know, I mentioned earlier, we have the Texas, uh, Hills or Texas relay show. And so I finished my bike in time to ride it down there for a shakedown run. And we were getting ready to go to Arizona bike week on all the bikes so I was kind of getting mine ready for that. And then, uh, mind you, I still have my bike club. That's still going on in the background. We're doing a lot of cool shit, having a good time. Uh, and um, a couple other dudes had jumped on Harleys at this point and left the sport bike stuff alone. So we kind of had a couple baggers and then, um, you know, a couple sport bikes. But still all good-looking bikes to, none to, like, to not say, I mean, just in general, right? Sorry, I'm getting, getting lost in my thoughts of this time in my life but the uh you know just 
I got the bike done. We got down there. We went to the Texas Hit Relay Show. We had a good time. We get back, and we had a week to get ready to go to Arizona Bike Week. Uh, we ended up the money investor guy. We ended up getting his street glide done, and then Demarcus he was still building his bike. We weren't even close to being dunks. He was somehow, like I said, he had so much money. So we had all had like a little finite amount of money we were putting in this bike. But this dude's doing a motor. He's getting everything diamond cut. He's having fucking matching rear wheel. Like this dude's going all out. And we're like, where the fuck is this guy getting this money from? And so lo and behold, like because of this and because of my exposure I already had in sport bikes and becoming into this and the, all the magazine coverage that we got from the Harleys in that first year we started doing Harleys, all of a sudden I kind of, some of the bigger shops in the country, plus going to V Twin Expo, going to Arizona Bike Week, um, Rot Rally, um, all these shows we were going to, like people in the industry started knowing me from other shops, right? And one day we were at the shop, man, and uh, that dude Demarcus, you know, me and Nick were arguing about something. Um, I think he was working on his boat, and th- like I had a customer base that I was still taking care of. But you know, Nick, we had became a focal dealer, and Nick was kind of working on his boat, and I was like, dude, we got this guy's bike, and he's get done. You need to wire handlebars. You need to put a wheel on it. You need to do this. And I'm bitching at them, like because everybody's just doing their own fucking thing and not taking care of customers, right? And then DeMarcus, you know, see, here's me and Nick kind of going back and forth. And he busts out the fucking showroom, goes, the fuck's going on around here? I, I cut the checks. Y'all need to shut the fuck, you know, just like out of fucking line. And there was customers in there, too, which I probably shouldn't have been having my little spiff with Nick at the time. But there were customers in there. And he just made us both look like little bitches in front of these customers. Like, we didn't even own this motherfucker. So I, I turned around and went up in his face. I was like, man, fuck you, blah, blah, blah. You know, I was ready to fight this dude. You know what I mean? So we ended up, I, I went over to my shop where the paint side was and into my office and I was just kind of heated and the dude and DeMarcus came over, started talking to me and I kind of told him how I felt. I was like, dude, I don't see how you come in here making the same kind of money I do and you're wearing what you got on right now. Why can't, how are you affording that and that new bike you just bought on top of the 2012 that we already all had? How are you affording all this shit? So I started fronting them out alone which I shouldn't have done. I should have did it more publicly around the rest of the people in the shop, but I fronted him out alone on where this money was coming from. So I think he knew that I was catching on, which it didn't take a fucking rocket scientist to figure out you were stealing money from the, the money guy. But I called him out. I was like, so you fucking, you, you taking money or what? And he goes, man, he told me his family had oil money or some bullshit like that. This dude had, he was just, he was on that fucking, you know, 10th layer of his lie. And he did, he was, he was done, dude. But this was in the uh, beginning of June. And uh, the, the you know, my orange bike had just got shot for the magazine in, in April. And the magazine was going to be on the cover. It was coming out at the end of June. Uh, we finished Marcus's bike, took it to Rot Rally. Um, you know, John Shope was there. He was hanging out with us. Uh, Sean from TOL was there. He was actually staying with us. You know, there's just a lot of stuff going on. And then uh, I started getting phone calls from from friends and from painters that I know. Uh, apparently, you know, DeMarcus and Nick started, you know, calling out to people, trying to find other people to uh, replace me, you know, other painters to come in. And, you know, like I said, I knew everybody. So they're all hitting me up going, hey, dude, uh, what's up, man? I thought this was your company. These dudes are saying you ain't got no part of it or something like that. So I was like, damn, you know, like that's fucked up, like. You bring these people into your brand that you built, you know, and just to be like so backstabbed by everybody like that, that would that that was like probably the scariest, lowest point in my career was, you know, the day that I knew everything was going going down. I had just signed a lease. M- mind you, when I was told you I, I was staying at my mom's and other chicks house for this time. I just signed a lease on a loft in downtown Dallas. I was super stoked. I felt it felt great to, you know, be back in my own place and and I've always wanted to live in a loft. It was kind of like one of my childhood dreams. And um, you know, just the lease was already signed and these phone calls started coming and you know, the uncertainty and just being at the shop was just not it didn't feel right. It felt fake. It felt unwelcoming. And so on the 5th of uh, you know, july which was seven 
eight eight months after um, I had sold them, you know, they became partners of the shop. I just walked in there and said, "Out, you know, I'm I'm one out, you know." Be I didn't want them to, you know, put me out on 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 in a situation where I wasn't prepared for it. So I just I kind of reached out to a couple of body shops that I knew of and found a place that I could go, uh, you know, kind of do my work that I had um, and get by. And then, uh, you know, I, I just fucking went in there. It was, it was, I was alone. You know what I mean? Uh, Nick and Demarcus and the accountant were in there and they had already had paperwork written up and I signed over the, uh, the, my shares of, of my company and, you know, everybody was there. I, I load up, loaded up the things that were mine a hundred percent right there while everybody stood there and left. And, you know, uh, it was it was tough, man. It was the scariest step back out into you know the world. You know, like I said, I, I felt so fucking horrible because you know my buddy Brandon, you know, went out on a limb and gave me an opportunity, invested in me, and you know I, I ended up, you know, I, like I said, I, I didn't fuck him or anything, or at least I don't, you know, I don't see how I could have. But you know, I got him all his money back, and I I, I thought that this partnering partnering up with these guys were gonna like you know, put us in another level or, or build that real business that I'd always been thinking of this huge, you know, Walmart fucking shop. Right. And, uh, having that lease, you know, on that apartment, it was 1100 fucking dollars. It's the most expensive place I had ever stayed in at this point in time. I'm 30 years old. Uh, it was scary, man. It really was, man. But, uh, I guess I'm a hustler, you know, (laughs) cause I immediately just did what I did, you know, 10 years prior to that. I went, up and down the street, I found body shops. I found places like they did custom stuff, and I just walked in and and showed them my little fucking flip book of of stuff. And you know, I started getting work here and there, and uh, I was able to make it. You know, and then the, the help of you know my bike club, like I said, there's they. I almost feel like I should do a whole podcast just talking about the experiences that I had with these guys. But you know, the bike club was a huge help. They you know some of the people that were involved at the time they they stepped up and helped out big time and. And, you know, help me get on my feet and help me get work and stay afloat and this, that, and the other. And, you know, come the, – the hardest part about the whole deal was is that I had built a brand and a name. And I had to leave that brand and that name there and go try to reestablish myself under another name. While, you know, not everybody was on my spa- or, uh, Facebook and Instagram. So, you know – there was going to be a lot of work that wasn't going to come my way because they were going to go to that shop where they knew that I was, you know, and of course those guys are going to be like, Oh, you're looking for Jace. Well, he's over here. There were certain customers that followed me, you know, there's certain custom customers that stayed and, you know, of course it wasn't like <laughs> the thing that sucked the most was, is it as soon as it all went down, Gary from other side customs was right there. He was he started painting their bikes. They took all the bikes that I painted for them and they repainted them through Gary, you know, because they didn't want anything with my work on there. And and it, you know, having Gary there was just reinforcing like the hate for me and stuff to these guys to where they could, you know, feel like like they did the right thing by fucking me out of my own business. You know what I mean? And uh, it sucked, man. Like I said, I never want to be that guy that 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 oppresses another person trying to build a business or build themselves. And that's why during these podcasts, I always wanted to lift people up and I always want to show people that are who I think are doing good things, you know, in the paint industry and stuff like that, because the way it felt having my old business and the biggest custom paint shop in this part of the country, you know, bad mouthing me when all I did was speak my mind or tried to prove that I was, that this guy was stealing money. And I'm the bad guy. You know, it was, it was, it was, it's hard. It, I mean, keeping my sanity through all that stuff and not flipping out and going crazy, which I may have, I don't know, but I don't, I don't, I have no idea how, you know, I managed to get through it without really going crazy. But I do think that I owe a lot of it to my bike club because they were, a, they were a, a tight knit, a tight group of people that I was able to confide into and, and, and there were people that I can go have, you know, beers with and go shoot the shit and, and vent with, you know, it was, it was really important for those people in my life at that time, you know, and, uh, you know, that, that, 
you know, July all the way to December, man, you know, we, I just focused on my bike club. I focused on small work. I wasn't really trying to build a shop or nothing like that. I was just doing it. I was just doing whatever I could to get by. I was, you know, I even buffed some cars a couple times, just, just whatever I could do to make it, you know what I mean? And it was, it was fucking tough. Had to borrow money from my grandfather a couple times, you know, just to get through the month. Um, but I made it, you know what I mean? And I started, you know, sketching bikes here and there for a certain group of people. And then, a friend of mine or a shop that I knew of through the, 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 um, what do you call it? The sport bike industry, you know, he kind of also went the bagger route as well. And he was doing a lot of shit in North Carolina. His shop was called, uh, it is called, uh, custom cycles limited. And, uh, it's Andrew Rumley. And this dude was like, he saw what happened through the shop and he reached out to me, you know, asked if like he could, uh, you know, if I would draw him some sketches for, some bikes that he was building because at this point in time the beginning of 2014 um the 32 inch wheel was coming out like they were going to be unveiled at the drag uh, at the uh, v-twin expo at the end of or at the beginning of february so he was building these two bikes for he was one of uh, three shops that got the 32 inch wheels and tires because the 32 inch wheels the tire rights were owned by metal sport so you know if like another wheel company decided to make a 32 you could only get a 32 tire if you bought a 32 inch wheel from metal sports so they they had a monopoly on it or whatever so it was a crazy fucking time man like i said i'm sitting in the loft and you know kind of snowed in i still have my bagger i'm still making it you know i'm getting by Uh, at this point in time i paid off that car that i got a while back you know so i'm rolling that honda accord you know what i mean fucking making it and uh I'm fucking like, I don't, I don't, you know, me and I, I didn't really have any, a girl at the time. I was kind of fucking lonely and shit. So I'm just kind of like plenty of fishing it up trying to, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's girlfriend season and I was trying to do hood rat shit all fucking year. You know what I mean? So I never focused on trying to find me a winter snuggle. You know what I mean? So that's when, uh, you know, Instagram started getting super big and that's when the uh, direct messages started coming out where you can like send people messages and shit. And, uh, I had found this chick, you know, she was living out in Florida and she kind of like commented on something that I was following. And uh, she said like that she thought painters were sexy. And in my mind, like this girl, you know, she had the kind of look of like, you know, when you envision like the kind of chick you want to be with, like she had that that look that I was like super interested in or that I am interested in, you know, and uh, I reached out to her in December and we started shooting the shit and talking and and uh you know like that became something you know trying to find the best way to like word how all this went down but you know uh headed towards going i don't know oh, well here's the deal let me just pause right here and we'll get back to this yeah so long story huh and i'm only like to 2014 that's crazy right but i decided to stop right here because you know a lot of what I talked about to this point is kind of like vague memories or not necessarily vague, but it's just kind of like, it it was just a lot. It's kind of, it's foggy. You know what I mean? But come 2014, I feel like, you know, that was a real pivotal point in my life with changing, um, you know, starting to travel more, starting to have my eyes open to so much stuff. And, um, and I really wanted to give that this part of my story, the, the, the best justice. So, um, stay tuned. I'll have this done on the next day we release a podcast. So um, I want to thank my sponsors, as always, uh, Texas Performance MC, TexasPerformanceMC.com, and on IG, um, my dudes at Paint Huffer Metal Flake um, on IG. Also, if you want to order some of that fucking dope shit, go to PaintHuffer.com. Uh, HorsepowerInc.net, if you want to get some fucking power under your legs, um, Horsepower Inc. on Instagram, Horsepower Inc. Indie on Facebook. Um, these dudes are doing big shit, so you better be doing some big following on these dudes, right? Uh, and also, don't forget about Hard Drive, uh, HDTwin.com. Um, glad to have those guys on, showing this, showing you know some support to this podcast. So, uh, Hard Drive Parts, if you want to see some of the things that they sell on Instagram. Uh, but I advise you, if you want, if you're a shop and you want to pedal some good parts, go to HDTwin.com and. Um, Get set up as a dealer and start fucking pushing that shit like a drug dealer, bro. Um, yeah, so I think the the next podcast will be the 
the next part to this if I can get it recorded because I'm doing the outro now and I haven't recorded this part yet. So um, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if anything, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't fucking know. I just, I hope you dig it, man. I hope you liked it. Uh, I'm not as interesting as maybe some people in the world, but, you know, I just, maybe all my stories might make more sense now if you listen to this podcast quite a bit. So anyways, thank you. Uh, don't forget to check us out on patreon.com or the fast life, or, sorry, fastlifegarage.com. You can check our Patreon and all that good shit and support us. Uh, follow us on YouTube, subscribe, whatever that's called, and just keep sharing this shit and helping us grow. And uh, we'll keep putting out podcasts, bro. Thanks. Have a good Tuesday. Nice.